On May 2nd, 2011, Nicholas Farmer was at Professor Tom's on 2nd Avenue in New York City. Maurice, the bartender, nudged him and said, Hey, Nick, there's the author of Game of Thrones. They were all there to watch the HBO version of the book. Nicholas approached the creator, and a conversation ensued. He asked if he'd heard of authors at Google, and if he'd be interested in speaking there. Friendly guy that our guest is, he said, have your mother contact my publicist. It's up to him. <laughs> I turned to our authors at Google Network. The publicist was contacted, and a return email offered, July 28th at noon. Work for you? Yep. So here we are today, July 28th at noon, our first live streaming of an Authors at Google event. Thank you all for joining us. You, the viewers, have shaped the questions we will be asking today. And thanks to all the people here at Google that helped make this event possible. And now, our one and only, Dan Anthony, will introduce today's guest. Wow, this is awesome. We've got one of the largest rooms on campus and it's packed to standing room only. Mm -hmm. About the only thing that would be, uh, would be cooler than this was if uh, uh, Joss Whedon came rushing in the door and said he suddenly had to cast a Googler to star opposite Scarlett Johansson. <laughs> I think uh, for a lot of us, fantasy, our journey into fantasy is an individual thing. And you know, it's very much of our generation. Um, as a child of the 70s, like I suspect a lot of people in this room, uh, you know, my first foray into fantasy was a sort of Shannara, and I never looked back from there. It took me a while to get to A Game of Thrones, uh, which, as hopefully everyone knows, is the first book in A Song of Ice and Fire. And like a lot of people in this room, I suspect we had some of the same touch points. You know, David Eddings, uh, Robert Jordan, Terry Goodkind, Tolkien, you know, all the folks who really make up the backbone of fantasy. But I think one thing we can all agree on, no matter how we got here, is Game of Thrones. It's, it's certainly not the sort of Shannara. <laughs> but it probably helps that uh, as a New Zealander, fantasy's kind of in our blood, and we're used to weird things. So not only do we have Australians to deal with, <laughs> but we've got orcs, goblins, hobbits, dwarves, horse lords, you know, men in leather with, with swords and whips and chains and, you know, heck, that's, that's pretty much any Auckland nightclub on a Saturday night. Um, but what we don't have is any characters as awesome as the world's fam favorite dwarf, Tyrion Lannister. And George, that doesn't mean you can kill him off now. <laughs> but Tyrion's only one of many. And we have Arya, we have Cersei, Jaime, Ned for the 10 minutes he was alive. <laughs> <laughs> and it's not just the main characters that are really interesting. There's a whole host of smaller characters. Uh, Davos, Bronn, uh, uh, Sirio, you know, and these are all compelling and richly realized. And possibly part of that is the way the story is structured. When your characters have an average life expectancy of 37 pages, you kind of <laughs> have to have a long life cycle. But regardless, it's given us a really rich world to get immersed in. And now we've got the HBO series which is bringing a whole new realm of, of audience to these books. And for those of us who are readers of the books, it means that we now know we have to get the next two books within six years because they need them for season seven of the HBO series. <laughs> <laughs> but the really cool thing about these books, and I think the thing that resonates, is they are truly a worldwide phenomenon. You know, they're in 22 languages or 20 odd languages, and I just got back from a around the world trip. I had eight different countries, four different continents, and every country, I found people I could talk to about the books that really got into it. And there's something really cool about walking into some rinky-dink little uh, bookshop in the back streets of Hong Kong, and front and center is Game of Thrones on display. But I learned something on the trip. So in India, it seems they censor HBO, and they censor it quite heavily. I also learned that in India, they don't like, Siri, they don't like movies where the hero dies. So this leads me to believe that in India, Game of Thrones is going to be 23 minutes long. <laughs> and it's going to be the most unpopular 23 minutes in television history. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, the man who's given us one of the best fantasy series of all time, one of the most compelling reasons to watch television today, and the man who made it acceptable for nerds to talk about fantasy in public again. <laughs> Please join me in welcoming George R. R. Martin.
Oh, thank you all. It's a, it's a thrill to be here. This is uh, quite a kick for me. I'm, I'm on my book tour now for uh, Dance with Dragons and um, visiting uh, a city a day. Um, it's sort of a blur where I, where I am right now, but uh, I've done many events. Uh, this is the first time I've done one like this. Uh, however, we're, we're, uh, most of the audience seems to have computers in their laps. That's sort of intimidating. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, interesting, very interesting. So it, it, it's, uh, you know, I came out of the, the world of um, science fiction. I wrote a lot of science fiction early in my, uh, my career. And I've always gone back and forth with other science fiction writers about whether fantasy and science fiction are, in fact, two different flavors of the same thing, which is my contention, or whether they're absolute polar opposites and, and fantasy is corrupting the precious bodily fu fluids of science fiction, which is the uh, contention of, of others. And I think the fact that I'm here at this campus devoted to the world of computers and the cutting edge of tomorrow, and you're all fantasy geeks, is proof that I'm right. And it's, it's all one big thing. <laughs> Thank you for coming, George. We, we really appreciate it. Um, and a, a token of our appreciation on behalf of the whole project team presented by the person who designed these fine t-shirts that we're wearing. Oh, well, thank you. Thank you very much. It's entirely inspired by you. <laughs> our take on, on the wonderful mythos that you created and you combined it with the Android. So it's a homage. Great. Thank you. Thank, thank, thank you. you very much. Take care. And we do expect you to wear it on your next television appearance. Oh, okay. <laughs> so uh, for everyone in attendance and the folks on the stream, um, we have taken the most popular questions from the YouTube uh, page, the moderated page, and from internal Googlers. And we'll be going through those questions today. One of the guiding principles we have, since a lot of the folks here are going to be new to the series and know it either from television or from just reading the first book, is we're not going to ask any questions that touch on content matter beyond A Game of Thrones. So even if your question got bumped up, unfortunately, we may not be asking it today. So with that, we have a question from Jigger444. <laughs> you mentioned you had trouble cutting down some of the ARIA chapters for A Dance with Dragons. Would you ever post the unused material on your website? Um, no, probably not. <laughs> um, I do save everything. When I, when I cut material, I do save it because I may find a place for it later. And there are things that uh, you know I cut out of the second book that I find a place for in the fourth book, and that sort of thing is 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 uh, constantly going on. But I'm still carrying forward material that I cut from the first book. Uh, some of it, as short as a single pithy sentence that I particularly liked but no longer fit, and others um, half chapters uh, of that uh, that I took out. Um, and maybe I'll find a place for that, but I have a feeling that much of that and more will still be in my uh, my files when uh, when the whole series is done. Uh, but I don't know. I ever wanted getting out there. It's it's uh, it's uh, you know taken out for a reason. There's one chapter from uh, from the new book from Dance with Dragons that uh, I. This does go beyond uh, Game of Thrones, but uh, I'll be vague. Uh, there's, this, there's this Tyrion chapter that drove me crazy all through the, the decade, it seemed, that I worked on, on Dance with Dragons and its precursor Feast for Crows, uh, uh, where I kept putting it in and then taking it out and then putting it in and then taking it out and then I put it in as a dream sequence and then I took it out and then I made it a series of recurring dreams, each one going slightly further, so I put it in seven chapters and then I took it out of those seven chapters. And <laughs> it, it, it's, it's, uh, it's one of those chapters that I think is by itself is, is, a, is a terrific chapter. I, I like the way it came together. It's vivid, it's kind of spooky, it's uh, got some really great visual imagery in it and it leads me absolutely down a dead end where if I take that path, I'm, I'm kind of stuck on a, on a detour and uh, so I had to take it out. That chapter I may, I don't know, publish at some point down the road, but not most of the other material. Great. So the next one is a multi-part question, and uh, it came up a lot on the uh, public site, and there are also some Googler questions around it as well. Have you ever, and uh, this comes from 
somebody whose name I can't pronounce in Vancouver. Uh, have you ever been influenced by some of the crazy theories your fans come up with for mysteries in the books? Have you ever changed an aspect of your story based on fan feedback, i.e. if one of their theories is better than what you originally planned? <laughs> uh, no. Uh, but I am concerned about that possibility, which is one of the reasons I, I don't tend to read the, the fan boards. I mean, when the first fan boards started occurring and they started theorizing and analyzing the books in such detail, and I'm going back now to the mid-90s, really, when the, when the first boards appeared, uh, Dragonstone coming out of Australia that Peter Gibb ran, I think was the first board I was aware of, and a couple others came up after that. I was very flattered, and I did read all the theories. And then precisely this point occurred where it says, you know, um, what if they're guessing the things that I haven't revealed yet? What if they guessed them correctly? How does that affect me? Do I then say, oh my God, they figured it out already, I better change it? Uh, or do I just ignore it and plow ahead? And what if they come up with better ideas than the ones I had? Do I steal them? Uh, um, and I didn't like any of these possibilities, so I said it would be better for me to try to keep my distance and uh, not, not go on these boards and, and try to, I, I, it somehow it's a futile effort because people also write me emails and people come to public forums like this and, and you know, they come up to me at signings and whisper their theories in my ear and, <laughs> and things like that. So I am kind of aware of some of the speculation out there, but I, I try to keep my distance from it precisely because I don't want to be impacted. I mean, you know, it, it's one of the... It's one of the drawbacks of the, the whole internet culture and this world that you guys have created uh, that um, something that previously maybe one reader in a thousand would have guessed, but you still had the other 999 who would have no inkling until you reveal it in a book. Now that one person in a thousand puts it on an internet message board and everybody sees it and they say, oh yeah, yeah, that's right. Now I see the clues, I got it. And pretty soon half the readership or at least the internet savvy portion of your readership knows it. But what do you do then? Do you change it and come up with something goofy and outlandish that you haven't led the, you haven't done the, the foreshadowing for, that you haven't laid the foundation for just in order to surprise people? I mean, sure, I could have like aliens come down and that would certainly <laughs> surprise the hell out of everybody. No one is predicting that, but uh, <laughs> it would ruin the series. So, uh, so basically you can't, you can't let yourself be influenced by this stuff, is, and I try not to. Great. So uh, Rita Meyer, who is a Googler, asked, so as a result, you know, as a sub-question, with the books now being adapted for a successful TV series that you also write for, do you think this will have an influence on the decisions and choices you make in the novels? Uh, well, once again, no. Uh, I, I hope not. I, the novels are novels, the TV series is the TV series. And they're two different beasts. Uh, the TV series is very faithful so far. I, have a, I, I do write for a series. I do one episode per season. I'm also a co-executive producer on a series. I have a great relationship with, uh, with uh, David Benioff and Dan Weiss, who are the showrunners and the main writers on the series. Um, but ultimately, that's, that's their baby, and the books are my baby. And uh, <clears throat> there is the possibility that as faithful as we've started out and as faithful as we intend to be, that um, changes will come into effect. Uh, what I call the butterfly effect, which I'm sure, you know, being the audience you are, you all understand because you've read Ray Bradbury's The Sound of Thunder, you know. You step on a butterfly in the Pleistocene and it seems very minor, but uh, suddenly you return to the future and all of human history has changed because uh, of that butterfly, a, a small change can produce large changes later on. And that's, uh, that's a question on the show. I mean, we've already seen in the first season, as faithful as it was, at least two significant departures. Uh, one, one character who has uh, um, his tongue torn out with hot pincers, uh, who later 
in my books, uh, that doesn't happen to him, and 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 he's around and and gets involved uh, pretty seriously in some stuff in book three. Um, he's not going to be around to do that. So David and Dan are going to have to remove that stuff or create a new character or somehow address that problem. Uh, similarly, the the great scene in book one, uh, or in the in the first season where Khal Drogo uh, confronts the man Mago and uh, the 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 Dothraki blood rider and. and rips out his tongue, uh, a terrific scene, uh, completely made up by, largely by Jason Momoa and uh, by Dan and David. It uh, doesn't happen in my books. Uh, Mago is still alive in the books and uh, still has yet to be dealt with. So these kind of butterfly effect things may produce changes down the road, but I mean, what am I gonna do? Go back and retroactively re rewrite uh, book one? Maybe I should. Uh, <laughs> That throat scene was great, but <laughs> um, no, I, I can't let myself be affected. Uh, I am aware of what they're doing in the show. I advise Dan and David whenever they're about to hit the butterfly effect, and, and sometimes they change according to that, and sometimes they plunge ahead. So the two beasts are the two beasts, and each one is separate from the other. Okay. Uh, so coming from Tanati in Slovenia, what was your favorite, and well now we know this, what was your favorite and least favorite scene in HBO's Game of Thrones? <coughs> my, my favorite scene, well this of course, I suppose everybody's seen the series now, I don't have to worry about giving things away, but my, my favorite scene had to be the, uh, the end of book, uh, end of episode nine, the execution of, uh, of Ned. I thought they did that very powerfully. Um, it was, you know, not precisely as described in the books, <coughs> but uh, it was certainly moving and evocative. The director did a great job on it. The scriptwriters did a great job. They added a wonderful grace note, which is when, when Ned is being led up to the stairs where he, he sees Arya and he says to Yorin of the Night's Watch as he passes him, he says, Baylor, to set in motion Yorin saving Arya which is not in the books. Um, in the books, Yorin just spots her on his own and takes his own initiative, but it was a great idea to, to give that little moment, that one last kind of heroic act by, by Ned. Um, so I love that, I love what they did with that moment. But there were a lot of great scenes that I love. The, uh, the, the final scene with Danny, the season closing episode, you know, which I was in. Uh, considerable trepidation about because you know how how good were the dragons going to be? Uh, that's a big CGI thing, and uh, <clears throat> we're you know it's a it's a reality of television today um, that television has become so good, and the technical standards of television have become so good that a large portion of the audience is judging us on the basis of what they're seeing on major motion pictures. So we always have to, to run uh, um, the risk of, uh, you know, if we do CGI, people will say, well, it's not as good as what I saw in Lord of the Rings or, or in the latest, uh, you know, big budget science fiction picture. And it's so frustrating because, of course, those shows have immensely more time than we do and they have budgets that are 10, 20, 100 times our budget. Uh, and, you know, there was a time when the audience made that distinction. They did not expect <coughs> the... Uh, a chase scene on an episode of T.J. Hooker to match uh, <laughs> what they would see in Bullet or uh, or The French Connection or, or you know a major motion picture cop scene at the time, but now they do expect it, and it's a it's a challenge for our special effects guys and our technical guys to live up to. We have a very sizable budget for uh, for a television show, but it's still a television budget and it's not a feature film budget, uh, so we're always having to wrestle with that. Uh, least favorite scene, um, you know, I don't, I don't know that I really have one. Um, I suppose my least favorite scene that actually appeared on, on camera, would be the 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 hunting scene where Robert uh, is is boar hunting because you know there was like uh, Robert and Renly and Baristan were sort of tromping through the woods alone, and I I talked to Dan and Dave and said you know there should be like. Hundred other guys and horses and tents and when the king goes hunting, it's not like, okay, I'm walking through the woods with a spear here. But, <laughs> um, 
and you know they don't disagree with that I mean they, they said yeah we would have liked all that stuff too but uh, once again it's budget you know we had an hour to shoot that scene and uh, uh, we, we we our horse budget was exhausted for the season <laughs> so uh, so there we were uh, so uh, you know it's the realities uh, I, I mean the great thing about writing books as I as I do now um, is that uh, my budget is unlimited I can I can write anything that I can think of, and I'm limited only by the size of my imagination and by the size of the imagination of my readers. <clears throat> but when you translate it to uh, television and film, you have the realities not only of the budget, which I've mentioned, but also of the shooting schedule. You know, you have to keep on schedule, and, uh, and if you have a lot of trouble getting the scene you were supposed to shoot in the morning, that gives you less time to shoot the scene in the afternoon, but you can't slop over to the next day or you start getting a, a rolling effect and you fall, fall further and further behind your shooting schedule and then you're you're more and more over budget and it become becomes a, a mess so uh, all, all of that impacts too and this is all the kind of behind the scenes I don't know technical stuff that really the viewers should not have to worry about it's the viewers really should just have to view the final product but uh, um, Nonetheless, for, for those of us concerned with behind-the-scenes stuff, it's a reality of life. The actual thing, I mean, for the most part, I loved all the scenes that were in the books that they translated to the TV show. I think they did all of those great. I also loved the vast majority of the new scenes that they did. Um, if I have any quibbles with the show, it, 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 and they are quibbles, very minor thing, it was the missing scenes, the scenes that weren't there at all. As I, as I watched the show, um, you know, frequently I would find myself thinking, oh, okay, now they're getting up to this scene. That's really good. I can't, oh, they didn't have that scene. <laughs> <laughs> they skipped over that scene. And some of them were scenes that I had seen the actors do in auditions. They had been scenes that actually had helped the actors get their roles. So I really expected them because I already knew, oh, the actor will do this great. I saw them do it in an audition, you know, sitting in a, in a room in front of a curtain. And now I'm going to get to see them do it in, in costume on the set. And then, oh, it's not there. <laughs> so I would have loved to have two more hours to have a 12-episode season instead of 10. Um, and, of course, to have, you know, an extra $50 million. But... Uh, <laughs> But who of us wouldn't want an extra fifty million dollars? They did do a great job. Yeah. I mean, w as a fan, when your only complaint is that Sirio has hair and that one guy looks like Orlando Bloom, it's a really. Good <laughs> we, we get a fair amount of people who are upset about no purple eyes too. Yeah, I get that. Why aren't their eyes purple? Well, try wearing purple contacts to see how you'd like it. <laughs> So, so Dan, we have um, we have some Googler questions that were collected through Google Moderator, and we'll kick off with one of these right now. Um, this one's from Peter in San Francisco. Um, he writes the uh, sex, nudity, violence, and gore in the HBO series. So, continuing with our previous question, um, has has been very much like the books. It preserved a similar feel. Um, could you please discuss the creative process around the inclusion of this mature content? Was there any pressure to tone it up or down? Well, of course, there was no pressure on me because I'm, I'm hardly involved. I mean, I, I am basically a consultant and uh, who writes one episode per season. And um, so whether there was pressure on Dan and Dave to go one way or another, I really don't know. Um, if, if so, they didn't share it with me. Uh, you know, we did make some decisions early on. Um, that we wanted to include that material and the the biggest one is where we took the show when Dan and, and Dave and I decided to that we would do this project together and I attached them uh, we discussed this at some length and said well, you know we have to go HBO was our first choice and pretty much our only choice if if HBO had said no or they weren't interested yeah we could have gone to another couple of our cable outlets but I think we were all agreed right from the beginning that we weren't going to go to the traditional networks, ABC or, or CBS or NBC or any of those, um, simply because they would have made us remove all of that material. It w everything would have been gone and, uh, you know, much toned down violence, uh, no sex whatsoever, or just sort of a few hints of sex, and certainly no inappropriate sex. And, you know, <laughs> a fantasy series. Um, they would have slotted us as an 8 o'clock show. I mean, I've been through this in my in my Hollywood uh, years. Uh, I worked 10 years in Hollywood from 
the mid 80s to the mid 90s and I worked on a couple shows uh, Twilight Zone the, the Twilight Zone revival and Beauty and the Beast both of which were eight o'clock shows uh, you know despite the fact uh, on both shows, we kept saying, we don't want to be an 8 o'clock show. We want to be like a 9 o'clock or a 10 o'clock show because the standards and practices, the censorship things are a little looser there, and you can do a little more material. And, and you know, the network guys would promise us, oh, well, well we know that. We, we really think of you as an adult show, not a kiddie show. But, you know, we have no room on a schedule, so we'll, we'll put you as an 8 o'clock show, but we'll treat you as a 9 o'clock show. And then we would be put as an 8 o'clock show, and, uh, and those guys, who were the programming guys, would suddenly no longer be around, and instead we'd be dealing with standards and practices guys, who were censors, who were saying, I don't care what programming told you, you're an 8 o'clock show, and these are our 8 o'clock standards. Um, so we made a decision right away, we're going to go with HBO. HBO has that kind of stuff, whether it's a 7 o'clock show, an 8 o'clock show, a 5.30 show, they don't care. Uh, <laughs> You know, you're signing up for HBO, you're paying a subscription, you know what you're getting, and uh, what you're getting is something you can't get on the over-the-air networks, uh, so that's, that's part of it. And then the other big decision we have to make um, to keep all that material um, was the ages of the characters. Um, you know, in the books, Danny is 13 years old uh, when, when all of this begins, and... Um, I was drawing, uh, although my books are fantasy, they're not historical fiction in a strict sense. They occur in imaginary world and, and imaginary kingdoms. They're very heavily based on real medieval history. And, of course, I've done a ton of research about real medieval history. And, you know, basically in the Middle Ages, they did not have our concept of adolescence. Um, of this sort of teenage year in between where we're kind of adults, but we're not adults, and we have different ages where, you know, we're allowed to vote at this age, and we're allowed to go to war and die at a different age, and we're allowed to drink at another age and to have sex at a different age, depending on which state we're in, uh, <laughs> all of that stuff. They had child and adult, and the difference between them was the onset of sexual maturity, and we still have in our cultures, uh, remnants of, of this older structure in our ceremonies, the Jewish bar mitzvah, the Catholic confirmation ceremony, which I went through as 13, uh, you know, reaffirming as an adult um, the, the uh, vows made for me by my godparents at baptism, you know, that's, that the Catholics once considered 13 adulthood. And I, I promise you that even at, when I went through my confirmation ceremony, my parents no longer cons did not consider me an adult even afterwards uh, that I went through the rite of passage. So, you know, these things are just remnants now. But they weren't remnants in the Middle Ages, and they're, they're not in the books. We have a very different way of looking at things. So I was using that based on historical precedent. But there was no way that was going to fly in our present environment. We couldn't do that. If we had cast a 13-year-old Danny, uh, there, there could have been no sexual stuff whatsoever with, with her. And um, even if we had cast, even if we had cast like a 17-year actress playing a 13-year-old, uh, there are some very stringent laws in like the United Kingdom. You can't you can't do that. Even if you have a an actress who's past the age of consent playing. Uh, someone who's under the age of consent, you, you cannot have a sexual situation because it gets into the old child pornography thing and stuff like that. So we have a 22-year-old actress playing a 17-year-old Danny instead of a 17-year-old actress playing a 13-year-old Danny. And, uh, you know, we did that deliberately to, uh, so we could include this material. So I think that speaks to the fact that we did think it was necessary to the story we wanted to tell and all that. Of course, once you make that change, then you have to make all of the other changes and you have to age up the other characters because Danny's birth ties to the, you know, she was born posthumously uh, nine months after the Battle of the Trident and the fall of King's Landing. And um, so the, the ages of the other characters has to be adjusted accordingly and it becomes a whole, you know, once again, the butterfly effect. It's that the whole thing is a tapestry and you can't just change one string without the whole thing unraveling. So. Dan and David made this whole series of changes, but uh, a long answer to a short question, I guess. Good, good answer, though. Yeah. Uh, so I know you've got the prequel novellas out there, uh, but DNJ, Sivan Lisa, and San Diego asks, 
Would you ever consider writing a prequel to Song of Ice and Fire series once it's finally done, such as the backstory of Liana and Rhaegar, or Ned and Robert? They'd love to see how it all started. And by the way, when you're answering the questions, feel free to correct the pronunciation. It's, it's okay. come up a few times. <laughs> um, you know, I, I, I don't have any plans to do any of those stories, but I never rule anything out. You know, if I get an inspiration or one of those stories uh, suddenly takes hold in my imagination and won't let go, sure, maybe I'll, maybe I'll do something like that. Um, one of the things I've been trying to do with the series is, is to tell these stories, tell the stories of Robert's Rebellion and some of the stories of the history of Westeros in successive revelations and flashbacks and people remembering things. So at the same time the story is moving forward, it's also kind of moving backward and gaps are being filled in and you're learning, and you hear about this event in, in the first book and then you hear a little more about it in the, in the second book and then in the third book you hear about it from a different person who has a very different version of what happened from the ver previous versions you've heard and then there's this hole in it which gets filled in, in the fourth book. So I hope by the time it's all finished I will have expanded backwards as well as gone forwards and many of the Many of the gaps will have been filled in, and you'll know more about the whole Robert and Rhaegar and uh, everything like that. Uh, <clears throat> but well, it's not quite the same as telling a story about them, I realize. I still have two more gigantic books to write, though. So, and, and uh, six years to finish them. And right, yes, I'm very fast. So, uh, um, I don't know what I'm going to write after that. Um, you know, whatever whatever seizes me. I mean, I like to do different things as as a writer. This is a this has been a huge project. Certainly, the biggest thing I've ever done in my my life or career. But uh, I've done other things and hope to continue to do other things. I as much as I love ice and fire and fantasy, I also love uh, science fiction. I want to do more science fiction work. I want to do more short stories. I love doing those. Uh, Wild Cards, which is a series I've been working on even longer than Ice and Fire. Um, I've been, in the beginning of Wild Cards, I wrote a lot for it as well as editing it. Um, now the series is still ongoing. Mostly I edit these days because I don't have time to write for it. But I'd love to go back and, and write some more Wild Card material about some of the characters for that. So what will I feel like writing after those six years are done? Um, who knows? Whatever I feel like writing on that particular day. There was someone at the podium, I think, who had another. Yep. Hmm. Hi. Um, so we have another question. Um, it is, given HBO's history of completely changing storylines, I'm looking at you, True Blood, how did you get them to stay so true to your complex as all hell novels? <laughs> uh, candy and chocolates. <laughs> <laughs> You know, it's 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 David and Dan, really. Um, David Benioff and and uh, Dan Weiss uh, are the showrunners. You know, I I don't have any veto power. Uh, you know, I I signed a pretty standard contract where uh, uh, I gave them rights to uh, to adapt this into a television series, and I got certain titles and and. Uh, um, the agreement I'd write one script a year and, and a, a large dump truck full of money. Uh, <laughs> and um, they can do, you know, they can have the aliens come down next season. Uh, they can turn the whole cast into vampires. Uh, um, and I'm, I'm powerless to stop them, but I, I don't think they, they will do that. Uh, they love the books, and uh, they seem committed to telling my story in a different medium. And I knew all that before I signed any of the contracts. I mean, when these books started hitting the New York Times bestseller list, uh, which was as early as Clash of Kings, I was approached by other people who wanted to adapt them, uh, many for feature films. And um, I had meetings with those people and, you know, heard their plans. How are they going to fit this giant thing in a feature film? Well, we're going to make it all about Jon Snow and we'll drop all these other characters. Or we'll make it all about Danny and we'll drop all these other characters. They had various schemes or, or of how they would do it. Uh, or, well, we'll just, make, uh, we'll just make the first book up to this point and then, you know, we hope that the movie will do well enough that they'll order a second movie. And, and, None of these really appealed to me, so I said no, which uh, is, it's always said that no is the sexiest word you can say in Hollywood. The, the, 
the more you say no, the more they want you. And uh, <laughs> I, I guess that was true because they kept coming. And uh, eventually, David and Dan came, and we had a, a wonderful meeting that lasted like most of a day. We we met for lunch, and and uh, you know we were talking and getting all animated about how we were going to do the series over lunch and in a crowded restaurant in Los Angeles. And little by little, it emptied out, and pretty soon we were the only people there, you know, drinking our seventh cup of coffee and iced tea and uh, still talking about it. And and then more hours passed, and we're still talking. And the restaurant, the dinner crowd is coming in, and uh, <laughs> they're setting up for dinner. I think we closed that restaurant that night. So. It was one of those classic uh, meetings that you, you only get once in a while, but I had a great feeling about them. I mean, you know, if you're J.K. Rowling, you can go into a situation where every studio in Hollywood wants you, and you can set very stringent terms where you get to approve everything. But uh, I'm, if you're not J.K. Rowling, and virtually nobody is J.K. Rowling except for J.K. Rowling, <laughs> then uh, you, you can't do that, and you have to find people that you trust and put your faith in, in, in them and in the understanding of the story. Um, which is something that I, I think I also understood a fair amount of that because of my 10 years working in Hollywood and the fact that I had seen the other side of the process. Uh, sometimes I think some of my fellow novelists who have not worked in television and film are very naive about this process. You know, they, they, they get an offer and there, there's the dump truck full of money and, uh, you know, they sign it, they, they, they cash the check and then they're not involved in the, in the series, you know, they may get invited to the premiere and they come out of the premiere looking like, you know, all of their children have just been gassed uh, and, you know, with a stunned look on their face because everything has been changed. Uh, and it's, some of them get very upset and start writing angry editorials and, and things like that. I haven't heard of anyone except Alan Moore actually returning the check, however. So uh, I, I think there's a certain, uh, I don't know, hypocrisy there. Uh, it's not a secret that Hollywood does change things, and, and maybe they change too many things. And when I have my writer hat off and I put on my, my reader, my fanboy hat, uh, I get you know upset as anyone, and I can go on for a long time about uh, you know how they change things in Spider-Man and the Fantastic Four in ways that I don't approve of, but <laughs> but um, you know nonetheless you you got to know the job is dangerous when you take it you know. <laughs> Great. Uh, this one's for the nerds. So Dan Foley one eight two in the UK asks: Is it possible to warg into a dragon? <laughs> Well, we'll have to see about that, won't we? <laughs> uh, Fusion, also from England, asks, how do you decide the characters that get to be a POV character? I read somewhere you resisted adding <coughs> a character as a POV for a while until finally giving in. Uh, so I wondered the kind of decisions you have to make in that regard. Are there certain traits that a POV character needs, or do they just need to be surviving? Well, I try to give each of my POV characters a story. And I've had an occasional POV character who only lasts a chapter and then dies. Uh, so in that case, it's a very short story. But it's, uh, it's nonetheless a story. It, it should have uh, you know, the semblance of a beginning and a middle and end. Um, even if it's not connected to the main story of the books, it should have a certain you know, Rosencrantz and Guildenstern are dead sort of thing. I mean, that was their story, which is off to the side of, of Hamlet's story, but it, both part of the larger story. Um, I, I try to resist having POV characters who are just there to be a pair of eyes. Um, you know, if, if the, a battle is taking place or someone is being murdered and I don't have a POV character there to see it, I tend to present that as a you know, report that someone receives or a rumor rather than just switching into third guardsman on the left uh, so, so, I can, so I can have him see that because uh, I don't like that as a reader and I don't like that as, um, as a writer. Um, but one of the criteria, so, so I, I guess one criteria is do they have a story and what is, what is the story of the POV character? Um, 
another thing, though, is the thing of pair of eyes. I mean, sometimes you need the question is, is it important to present this thing on stage to, to dramatize it and have the reader actually go through it? Or is it sufficient that we just hear about it, hear a summary? Do you need full dramatization or is summary narrative sufficient? Uh, and if we need this the scene to be brought out, then we may need uh, a POV character there. And can I get any of my existing POV characters there? I mean, I've talked with those of you who read my, my not a blog uh, will know that uh, with Dance of Dragons, one of the things that I wrestled with for a long time was what I called the Miranese knot, uh, which I can't go into in any great detail without uh, spoiling tremendous things. But a lot, and you know, five years from now, maybe when if the next book is out or something and everybody has read this book, I, um, I can, I will talk more about that in more detail. But a lot of it simply had to do with um, a number of POV characters being together and some important events coming on, which some of them would, would see from one viewpoint and some from another, and some wouldn't really know what was going on. So how did I get these particular sequence of events across with what point of view? And I, I, would, I would write something from one point of view, and it wouldn't quite work, so I'd write it from a different point of view, and it wouldn't work either, and I'd try splitting it, you know? I finally solved that problem in, in, in part by introducing a new point of view um, who was much more centrally located, but he had been a character who had been there all along and he was deeply involved in the things and he was, um, he, it all fell into place once I introduced that, so you can have that kind of breakthrough. But uh, I do need to uh, kill a lot more of my point of view characters because <laughs> there have gotten to be an awful lot of them. Uh, but. <laughs> so, uh, uh, which ones will die? Well, you'll just have to keep reading to find it out. And I think the character you're uh, referring to is the one who was asked about. Okay, yes. Uh, another Googler question. Um, okay, so this question is asking, if you could take back one thing you wrote in any of your books, what would it be? One thing I wrote in any of my books, uh, well, I would, I would take back uh, the, the little one-page thing at the end of Feast for Crows where I say the next <laughs> book will be out within a year. <laughs> <laughs> that one has gotten me into no end of trouble. Uh, all I could say is I meant it at the time. I mean... Uh, I was splitting off 500 pages from a 1,500-page manuscript, so I only had to write another 500 pages. I can write 500 pages in a year. I've done it before. Uh, of course, the book tended, turned out to need an extra 1,000 pages, not 500 pages, and I wound up rewriting almost all of the 500 pages that I was pulling out, so I turned out to be a lot more than 500 pages. And, and even that being said, yeah, I can write 500 pages in a year, in a good year. I've had good years in which I have written entire 500-page novels start to finish. But that's not to say I can do it every year, regular as uh, clockwork. I am, unfortunately, a, a slow writer uh, and have always been a slow writer. But I'm a slow writer given to delusions of optimism that I can be a faster writer <laughs> under certain circumstances. And, uh, Sometimes I am, but uh, more often I'm, I'm not. Uh. Great. So we had a whole bunch of questions around this, so we had to pick one of the most popular ones and go with it. Uh, BT Fabian One asks, I'm just curious, several authors I read have discussed how hard it is to sometimes kill off certain characters, which clearly is not an issue here. Uh, you've certainly killed plenty off in your career, both in and out of A Song of Ice and Fire. Which character was the toughest to kill off? Well, I won't mention any character names, but The Red Wedding was the hardest thing I ever wrote. And those uh. who have read the books know what I'm referring to. Uh, that chapter occurs uh, about two-thirds of the way through Storm of Swords, but it was actually the last thing I wrote for that book. When I reached that chapter, I couldn't write it. I skipped over it. I wrote all the aftermath and you know the other things. I, I wrote The Other Wedding, in which someone also dies. That one was easy and fun to write. <laughs> <laughs> because, uh, you know, everybody wanted to see that little shit die. But <laughs> <laughs> uh, 
Actually, I'm I'm being glib. I should I should say, yeah, that was uh, an easier an easier chapter to write. But even even at the moment that that particular little shit does die, uh, I I tried to write it so that you would feel a moment of of empathy uh, for him in his in his dying, and uh, you know bring home the point that you know this too was a was a human being who was who was scared and uh, and terrified and and then dead. Uh, <laughs> But, um, but only after everything else was finished did I go back and, and force myself to write the actual wed reading chapter, uh, simply because it was so so painful to write. Uh, I, I invest a lot in these characters, and, and particularly the viewpoint characters. I live inside their skin, so it's a little bit like killing uh, part of yourself or smothering one of your children. Uh, but you know, some sometimes it has to be done for the service of the Almighty God of the story. And uh, the story always comes first. And, and related to that, do you ever find that uh, it would have been more expedient had you not killed the character off later on? Um, no, I, not really. Not really. Uh, it, you know, sometimes my, my readers write me and they, they wish I hadn't killed off particular character, but there was a reason for all, all of the major, the major character deaths. I mean, a lot of minor characters die too, and, and sometimes I don't even remember that they're dead, you know, I occasionally, <laughs> you know, I'm saying some Night's Watch expedition leaves out and it has Fred, Bill, and Sam on it, and, you know, Elio of Westeros points out, you actually, you actually killed Bill two books ago. Oh, damn. <laughs> all right, I forgot about that. <laughs> He died in a Fens attack, but fortunately I have fans who have uh, sharper eyes than I who will point out this stuff. But the major character deaths have, have all been planned and are all uh, a part of the story, and, and I, don't, uh, I don't regret them. Hopefully this means Syria will pop back up again. Uh, can we have another Googler question? Okay, so this next question is, in your books, there are several religious systems, um, such as the Seven, the Drowned God, the Faceless Man, the Old Gods, etc. How do you come up with such a detailed yet entirely, di uh, yet entirely distinct doctrines? Are there any that aren't detailed in the books? Um, well, yes, uh, to start with the last part first, yes, there are many religions that are not detailed. Uh, you can see some of them in, in Arya's uh, Bravos chapters where she visits, uh, passes through the islands of gods, and I throw in, uh, you know, I throw in references to 17 different obscure religions that I'm probably never going to reveal in, in much detail. Um, but uh, some of them are, of course, you know, little tips of the hats to uh, other, other fantasy authors and mythoses that I admire. I mean, if there, there is... Uh, there is both a Roger Selazny tip of the homage and a and a uh, H.P. Lovecraft homage in the on that Isle of the Gods for those who are sharp enough to us uh, to see them. I do that kind of shit all the time. So <laughs> the Three Stooges are in Book One if you're sharp enough to find them. <laughs> um, the major religions that actually play a significant role in the story uh, are somewhat based on real religions or real religious systems although I don't I don't believe in just doing you know a one-to-one -one transformation where I'm gonna take like Islam and file off the serial numbers and call it Mislam or something and <laughs> uh, pretend it's the same you know I take certain tenets of the religions but then I, I I maybe take part of this and part of that and I meld them together and I think about it and I add a few imaginative elements but you know certainly the old gods of the north uh, with the the trees worship I mean that's based on animism and, and traditional pagan beliefs of, of Wicca and uh, you know various other Celtic systems and Norse systems uh, melded into um, a construct of, of my own and and with the fantasy element of the the weirwood trees added as a as a central element there the the faith of the seven is you know very loosely modeled on the medieval Catholic Church um, 
but again, with different elements. I mean, of course, the Catholic Church, which I was, I'm no longer a practicing Catholic, but that was how I was born and raised, you know, has the whole concept at the heart of it, the Trinity, which was, uh, you know, explained to me as, well, it, it's three, but it's also one, you know, which kids can never get. It's like, okay, we have three gods. No, no, you're not a three gods. You have one god. He has three, you know, parts. Okay. So we don't have three, we just have one, right? It's like the shamrock, that was how, you know, the, the three-leaf clover. Um, so I, I did that, except I made it seven instead of three. I have the whole, well, we have seven gods, we have seven personas, so instead of Father, Son, and Holy Ghost, we have Maiden Mother Crone, which of course I took from paganism as the traditional female thing. I kind of hobbled the male side together and then I added the stranger as the, uh, as the god of death, who's, uh, um, also the center of the, the cult of the faceless men. I mean, I think worship of death is, uh, is an interesting basis for religion because after all, death is the one universal. It, it doesn't seem to matter what gods you pray to, uh, we all die uh, in the real world and in fantasy worlds. And if there was one culture where you did not die, I suspect that, would be, that god would become very popular. Uh, <laughs> They will promise us eternal life, but uh, whatever. So my, my faith with its hierarchies, its high septon and its seps and its um, orders of, of uh, you know, essentially monks and, and priests and so forth is, is loosely based on Catholicism. And then you have the, the red god, uh, the Lord of Light from uh, across the sea, which um, has a certain Zoroasterism um, elements to it with the, the fire worship and so forth and the, and the duality and also a lot from the Albigensian heresy, the Cathars who were exterminated by the Catholics in the great Albigensian crusade. But uh, they had the fundamental belief, uh, a dualist religion, that there were two gods. There was a good god and an evil god and the world we live in was created by the evil god. Um, which, you know, when you look at the world, particularly the medieval world, it's kind of persuasive. Uh, you know, what kind of good God would create that kind of uh, crap, you know? Uh, what kind of good God sits around and saying, hmm, leprosy, good idea. <laughs> Let's give them leprosy, hmm. <laughs> so, um, so the Lord of Light. Uh, so, yeah, all the religions are based. This is my general philosophy, I think, for fantasy is not to you know, base it in reality, but then get a little imaginative to it and rework the elements and put this with that and add your own your own touch to it. And But the grounding it in reality, I think, gives it a certain verisimilitude and plausibility where um, just entirely made up religions that are unconnected to anything, it's, it's much more difficult to make them uh, plausible. Okay. Emil Shin in Maine asks, if you lived in Westeros, which house would you like to be part of or in which area would you like to live? Well, you know, there's something to be said for, for being an honorable Stark, but, uh, you know, you're, you're kind of cold all the time and <laughs> poor Damn. and uh, so forth. You have a lot of land, but there's not a lot of stuff on it, you know. On the other hand, if you're a Lannister, you have a nice house and all the gold you want and uh, all of that stuff. So there's a, there's a lot to be said for being a Lannister. I don't know. Maybe I could, I could probably see being a Lannister. <laughs> <laughs> and I would always pay my debts. <laughs> Great. Let's take another Googler question. Okay, so this question asks, how do you keep all the secrets of the book to come to yourself? Are you dying to tell people what you know, or do a few people already know everything? <laughs> um, I'm not dying to tell everyone uh, what I know. I, 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 eventually, I will have to yield up all my secrets, but uh, actually, it, it, if anything, maybe I hold on to some of these things too long. I don't know. There's always the question, you know, when do you reveal something? Do you, how long do you draw it out? And, you know, the books are, are full of little puzzles and enigmas and uh, reversals and, you know, how do you, how do you place those? Uh, you don't want to give it away too soon, but if you, you stretch it out too long, everybody's going to guess it anyway. So, you know, at what point is, is that? But I, I kind of like, 
having the puzzles and you need to keep at least some of the puzzles to the end so uh, but then again you can't you can't keep them all to the end otherwise you you end with a final chapter that's just you know one guy endlessly talking about well there's this and then there's this and the <laughs> explanation for this is this and it's a very boring and and not very good chapter so uh, um, David and Dan know a few things, a few important revelations. So um, eventually if I am, you know, hit by a truck or something like that, they would know a few things. But they don't know all by any means. And my editors know a few things and have guessed a few things. Uh, so I suspect that some of the fans probably know more than anything else. I mean, I'm going to be doing the concordance, the Ice and Fire concordance is the next project, the world of Ice and Fire which is under contract to Bantam and Random House. And I'm doing that with Elio Garcia and Linda Antonson of the Westeros site. And uh, I swear they know Westeros better than I do. I mean, Elio's knowledge of it is just absolutely amazing. You know, I, when I'm writing books, I sometimes, you know, call him up and say, I'm, I'm about to introduce this character. I think I mentioned him in book three. Did I ever say what color his eyes are? And, you know, I, within a half hour, I get, you know, blue-gray, page 314, second book. Uh, oh, very good. <laughs> so. <laughs> Great. I hate eye colors. Everybody should have the same color eyes. I'm constantly, <laughs> I'm constantly getting screwed up on eye colors. Uh, Just make them all purple. Yeah. <laughs> So we probably have time for one more question. Um, and I think the next one's such a good one, we should probably use a Googler one. The question is, the women in leadership roles seem particularly challenged. Can you share your insights about women in positions of power? I don't know if I have any uh, particular views about women's in position of power, although I think it's it's more difficult for women, and particularly in a medieval setting, than for men because in addition to all the usual problems of having power, they have the additional problem of that they're a woman and a lot of people don't want them in a position of power in a what is basically a, a patriarchal society. Um, so that is a challenge to, to all of my queens or, or would-be queens. And once again, I'm drawing from medieval history on, on that. Um, you know, you can you can repeatedly see uh, some of the women who who assume, assume positions of power, be it Cleopatra in ancient Egypt, or uh, the Empress Maud during the uh, the Great English Civil War, the the war between Stephen and Maud. You know, who was essentially rejected simply because she was a woman, and um, even though her claim to the throne was very very clear cut and was endorsed by her father, the king, and yet they turned to a, a cousin instead simply because he had a dick. Uh, well, to be fair, he was also charming, and she was sort of difficult. So, uh, but uh, nonetheless, uh, there is that additional challenge. But one thing that I am trying to get at in the books, a, a political aspect, if you would, is to kind of show that this stuff is hard. I, I mean, I think an awful lot of fantasy, and, and even some great fantasy, falls into the mistake of assuming that the good man will be a good king. That is, all that is necessary is to be like a decent human being, and then when you're king, of course, everything will go swimmingly. And, um, you know, you, even Tolkien, you know, who is the, I think, my respect for Tolkien no, is second to none, and all modern fantasy flows from Tolkien. But there's an unspoken assumption in his books there that, you know, the return of the king. Aragorn is the king now. Everything will be, will be hunky-dory. You know, the land will prosper and it'll be wonderful and the crops will be good and there will be justice for all and the enemies will be defeated. And, you know, you never, you never actually get into the nitty-gritty of Aragorn ruling and, you know, what, what is his tax policy? <laughs> and how does he feel about crop rotation? And... <laughs> Um, you know, how does he handle land disputes between two nobles, both of whom think that they should have this particular village, so they take turns burning it down in order to uh, uh, establish this claim. Uh, th this is the hard parts of ruling, and uh, be it in the Middle Ages or now, and of course, it's not enough to be a good man, to be a, a, an effective ruler, and it never has been, you know, if it has been, you know, Jimmy Carter would be the greatest president of the 20th century. I mean, he's clearly 
I think, the best human being to be president in my lifetime, but he was not a particularly effective president uh, for all his, his decency and his humanity and his compassion uh, and his undoubted intelligence. I mean, the man was a nuclear engineer in, an, in the Navy, but nonetheless, uh, he failed at it. And there, been, there are some examples of uh, medieval kings in, in history who were terrible human beings, but they were nonetheless very good kings for their country. So it's complicated and it's hard. And I wanted to show not just with the, with the women, but you, know, you, you see in my books repeated examples of uh, both kings and, and the hand of the king, the prime minister, if you would, trying to rule. And, and whether it be Ned Stark or Tyrion Lannister or Tywin Lannister or uh, you know, Daenerys Targaryen in the latest book, Cersei Lannister in the, in the book before that, and trying to deal with some of the real challenges that affect anyone trying to rule the Seven Kingdoms or even a city like Marine. And it's hard. You know, we can all read these books or look at history and say, oh, so-and-so was stupid, they made a lot of mistakes. Look at all these stupid mistakes they make. But these kind of mistakes are always much more apparent in hindsight than when you're actually kind of faced with the decision about, my God, what... What would I do in this situation? How do I resolve the thing? Do I do the moral thing? But what about the political consequences of the moral thing? Um, do I do the, the pragmatic, cynical thing and just kind of screw the people who are screwed by it? I mean, it's hard. And I want to get to, uh, want to, get to all of that, and uh, be it a male ruler or, or a woman, woman's ruler. So everyone, that brings us to about time. Uh, thanks everyone in the room for coming along. Thanks for submitting your great questions. Thanks everyone on the stream for tuning in. And George, thank you so much for taking the time out to come in, answer the questions, and great, great to be present. My pleasure. It's uh, been a thrill to be here and uh, to uh, to take place in this uh, high tech computer things. Uh, I think you should uh, bring some of these strange machines of yours to Westeros. It could probably entirely replaced the whole thing of tying messages to the legs of ravens. <laughs> Great. Thanks, Great. George. Thanks. Good evening. I'm Harriet Hamasi, University Librarian at Brown, and tonight's program is brought to you by the Brown University Library and the Friends of the Library. The first scene, chapter one of the first book, the chapter where they find the direwolf pups, just came to me out of nowhere. I was at work on a different novel, and suddenly I saw that scene. It didn't belong in the novel I was writing, but it came to me so vividly. They had to sit down and write it, and by the time I did it, it led to a second chapter, and the second chapter was the Caitlin chapter, where Ned, had just come back. Was this series that begot the, the TV series Game of Thrones, would you call it a happy accident? Oh, I don't know I'd call it an accident. Um, you know, I, I, I know some writers talk about inspiration that comes to them in, in, in these, these uh, very almost mystical terms about, uh, you know, muses and, and uh, uh, inspiration coming to you from strange places. I, I, it comes from us, it, it comes from the subconscious, whether right brain or left brain or some, some brain. Uh, but it, it is part of me. I mean, I, I read things, I digested things, that idea was buried somewhere, but it came to the surface and I, I don't know what makes it come to the surface. Uh, I don't know where, you know, you get off, asked often, uh, where do your ideas come from? And sometimes you know, sometimes there's a specific incident or an inspiration that generates an idea, but 90% of the time you, you don't know. It's just there's suddenly there's an idea and sometimes a whole story or a scene. And it wasn't there yesterday, but today it's there. And uh, where did it come from? I don't know. But I'm certainly glad that they keep coming because you're in trouble if they stop coming one of these days. Tom. A fantasy. This question is for you, George. So you've worked as a screenwriter for TV, uh, including on such really important fantasy shows as Beauty and the Beast uh, and The Twilight Zone. 
So how would you say that that screenwriting experience affects your writing, both for your novels and for your TV work? And you know, can you tell us about that TV work? What, what is your role on the TV series? And what possibilities do you think television allows or maybe prohibits? Well, that covers a lot of ground. That's a big answer. Um, you know, my, my television career almost came about by accident. Uh, Although I watched a lot of television as a kid growing up, I, I began with as a prose writer, selling short stories to magazines and selling my first novels. Um, you know, I, I was through the early 70s and into the late 70s and uh, the early 80s. I was a hot young star in science fiction and fantasy and horror, each book doing better than the one before, winning Hugos and Nebulas. Um, until I published that fourth book, the, <laughs> the one that John has held up, The Armageddon Reg, um, which got me my biggest advance yet, was supposed to be my first bestseller, um, and it was a total commercial failure. Nobody, nobody bought it, and I discovered that uh, like almost overnight, my career as a publisher, as a novelist, seemed to be over. Uh, I couldn't sell my fifth novel. Um, I sold a short story collection, Tough Voyaging, a fix-up for like, a tenth of the money that I'd gotten for the Armageddon rag, so it was almost like I was having to start all over. Um, but oddly enough, the same book that closed off my career as a novelist opened my door to Hollywood, because Armageddon rag was optioned for a feature film by a guy named Phil Daguerre. He never got the feature made, although he tried for years. He wrote several screenplays. But Phil was also the television showrunner and, and creator who had done Simon Simon and some other hit shows, and uh, CBS came to him and said, well, we want more hit shows from you, Phil. What do you want to do next? He said, I want to bring back the Twilight Zone. And when he did, uh, he gave a lot of script assignments to science fiction, mm -hmm. fantasy, prose writers, people without any television or screenwriting experience whatsoever, which is very unusual. Um, and I was one of the lucky guys, because he knew me through our association on Oregon Reg. And they liked the first script I wrote, and next thing I knew, I wound up on staff there. I did five scripts for Twilight Zone, a couple for Max Headroom that were never produced. Then I went on to be a staff on Beauty and the Beast for all three years of that show. Uh, and then after that, I did five years of development doing pilots. So basically, I spent a decade in, in television and film. I think it did, when I came back to prose, I came back with tools and techniques that I had picked up from television that I think helped me as a novelist and, uh, and a prose writer. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, one of the things that people seem to like a lot in Ice and Fire is the way each chapter leaves you wanting more. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, that's a television technique. Yeah, that, that's a check. technique of the act break that I learned by working in television. You know, yeah. when, when you're going to, you know, you, you got a television show going on and you're going to have to cut to a commercial for, you know, beer or cars or, you know, whatever, uh, you want them not to change the channel. So you, you end with an act break. And it, it can be a cliffhanger, but it's an oversimplification to say it's always cliffhangers. It's a, a resolution of something or an introduction of a new element or a twist, just something really interesting to end the, uh, the chapter with or the act with. Mm -hmm. And I applied that, that technique mm -hmm. to Game of Ice and Fire. So at the end of every chapter, there's, there's something. There's a, a, a twist, a turn, a resolution, um, an introduction of a new complication that will hopefully leave you wanting to find out what happens to Tyrion in the next chapter. But of course, I don't give that to you. Uh, <laughs> then you have to read about Arya, or then, you have to add, then you're, you're left at the end of the Arya chapter wanting to know what's going to be next for Arya, but now you have to deal with Jon Snow. So, <laughs> you know. <laughs> That's a television yeah, technique. I also think the years in television improved my dialogue. Um, if you compare my earlier novels, people were much more likely to give long, windy speeches. And uh, of course, that's very discouraged in television or film. You know, some of, the, some of the directors and the producers will just look at a page. They won't even read the dialogue. But if there's a big block that someone is giving a Shakespearean monologue, they hate it already. They want, they want little two-line ping-ponging back and mm. kind of back and forth. And that's actually a better way, it's a livelier way to, uh, to do dialogue, and it certainly had some influence on me in, in that regard. Structure, too. You know, William Goldman, in his classic oh. book, Adventures in the Screenplay, said yeah. that he had two proverbs there. 
that I took to heart. One is uh, structure is everything, and uh, the other one is uh, nobody knows anything. Right. Uh, so <laughs> those are both true, oddly enough. Uh, Great, thanks. I think kind of leads into yeah. the next uh, question that we were going to ask. So I have a question that's actually for both of you that's about the, I'm curious what you both think about the circulation of stories today in our era of multi-mediation, right? And I think that Song of Ice and Fire is really a key example of that. So not only is it a book series that obviously has been turned into a television series, but there's also you know, a great many other media texts that circulate around it, right? Dictionaries, wikis, maps, music videos, graphic arts, merchandise, et cetera, et cetera. So George, for you, I'm curious about what, do you, what does that mean to you as an author creating a fictional world where that world now exists in multiple forms? And then, you know, and, and of those multiple forms, I'm particularly curious to know what you think about the fan forms, fan rewritings, appropriations, remixing. So what does it mean for you as an author? And Tom, for Well, it's, a, it's been an interesting experience, to, to say the least. I mean, when most of my career, um, writing books like The Armageddon Rag and Fever Dream and Dying in Light before that, or all of my short stories did, there was no secondary rights. There were no subsidiary rights. Um, occasionally I would get a movie option, you know, most of which just paid me some money and they held the rights for a year or two and then you'd never see a movie or something. I did occasionally get something filmed. My novella Night Flyers was made into a, a film at one point. Uh, I had a, a story called uh, Remembering Melody that would became an episode of The Hitchhiker. So occasionally something came through, but there were no other rights beside that. But then with, with uh, when Game of Thrones started becoming popular, Song of Ice and Fire, suddenly I started getting these uh, offers that I had never had before for, from various people who wanted to do replica swords or miniature figurines or, um, you know, Comical. various types of games, uh, role-playing games, paper and pen role-playing games and um, video games and uh, just a bewildering number of things. and. Uh, I remember having through a period where I said, well, I don't know if I want to take any of these things. Some of them seem kind of tawdry. I, you know, I, I'm a serious writer, you know. Would F. Scott Fitzgerald have ever uh, <laughs> had bobblehead dolls? Uh, <laughs> and then I thought about it a little. I said, you know, from what I know of F. Scott Fitzgerald, he would have sold bobblehead dolls in a minute if they offered him any money for that. So he and uh, Zelda could have continued to party. <laughs> 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 so I, I signed these various contracts. And uh, um, I think they've both they've been good and bad things about it. Uh, you know, I, I didn't want to be just a guy who, who signs, a, signs a contract, cashes the check. I wanted to make sure that if I was going to do these products, that they were good products, that they were true to the mm -hmm. material. So initially, I wrote in a lot of approvals to all of these things, that they could, they could do the game or they could do the whatever it is, but I would have to approve everything. And that sounds good in theory, but of course what it led to me spending a lot of time approving stuff, and, and not only approving, but giving notes on stuff. Uh, and I was probably a little obsessive about it at first, and it, it wound up taking a lot of my time. So. I, I, I still don't want to let crappy products get out there, but I, I have pulled back a little on the approvals now that I know some of my licensees and who I can trust and who I can't trust. But the good part is that I discovered that there's an enormous synchronicity here yeah. because I, I've, my readership started to build yeah. from people coming in from other avenues saying, I'd never heard of your series, but I played the, the role-playing game, yeah. and uh, I loved the role-playing game. I thought I'd better look up the books, or, you know, I collected miniature figures and paint them, and I saw your figures that Dark Sword was doing, and I decided I'd better look up the books. So I was getting new readers from, from all of these things. It did cause a bit of a bump, uh, you know, with the uh, HBO deal, which came along a few years later. 
because uh, you know, customarily when you sell the rights to a TV or film company, they get all the merchandising rights. So HBO was saying, well, well here's the deal, and, and we get all the merchandising rights. I said, I can't give you all the merchandising uh -huh. rights. I've already sold it to these other people. And what do you mean? We, we always get all the merchandising rights. And you know, it, it wound up for a time that it was, looked like the whole deal was going to fall apart because you know, even if I wanted to give them the merchandising rights, I couldn't because I had pre-existing contracts. But thankfully, my lawyers and agents were finally able to, to iron that out. But it was a ludicrous, but what do you ludicrous think? negotiation at a point where it's saying, yes, well, we'll give you keychains, but we keep bobblehead dolls. <laughs> <laughs> you're, you're going through all of that with the, uh, with the agent. Uh, and, and now that HBO is going, of course, uh, the, the, I still have the old contracts that are, that are grandfathered in um, that are still direct to me, but everything that's not under contract went right. to HBO. So now there's just a flood of merchandising coming out because nobody knows how to merchandise like a television network or a, or a, a film studio. So there, there are new products coming out all the time, including some I never would have thought, like our own beer. I mean, it's great. We have our own beer. It's terrific. <laughs> what do you think about the ones that are not officially licensed? Again, like the fan appropriations and fan art, fan stories, fan rewriting. I, I've long been an opponent of fan fiction. Mm -hmm. um, I, I th I th and let me define fan fiction very precisely here, because sometimes I get criticized by people saying, you wrote fan fiction when you were young and now you criticize it, how dare you? I wrote what we called fan fiction in the 60s in comic fandom, but that was simply fiction written by fans right. and, and published without any money. Uh, and I certainly did a lot of that, but I never borrowed anybody else's character or world. I, I invented, I didn't, you know, I was a comic fan. I didn't write about Spider-Man or Superman or Batman. I, I created my own heroes, uh, you know, and wrote about them. The White Raider and Manta Ray and Garazan the Mechanical Warrior and all that stuff I was writing when I was 14 and 15. But they were my own characters and my own stories. What fan fiction has come to mean is writing Star Wars stories or writing Star Trek stories or, or writing, you know, slash fiction, which is, uh, you know, taking, taking characters and putting them together in, in unlikely sexual situations. Uh, uh, and, you know, I don't, I don't, you know, what I don't know doesn't hurt me, so I, if, if people want to do that, fine, but don't, don't send it to me and expect me to prove it or something. Now, fan art, that's, that's fine, that's right. a whole, whole other thing. Um, fan art is great, and people do send me links to that all the time. Uh, some of this you just have to, what you want to do for your own amusement is great, yeah. but you can't start selling it on eBay or, or merchandising it, because yeah. then it, you'll get sued, if not by me, you'll get sued by one of my multiple makers of bobblehead dolls or, or figurines <laughs> because you'll be moving into John one of the Stewart, areas right. that they're paying me good money to, uh, to be into. Right. So. In that same LA Times article, George, the writer says, Martin, and this is, a, I wasn't going to go here, but you mentioned F. Scott Fitzgerald and, uh, you know, kind of a bobblehead for uh, Gatsby. Martin transports us back to the halls of power. And that's why A Song of Fire and Ice often feels less like a, san a fantasy saga and more like Doris Kearns Goodwin's team of rivals. How much has history influenced your writing um, in this series? Well, it's, it's influenced hugely. I mean, I, history was my minor in college. I've always loved uh, reading history. Um, particularly medieval history, but I, I also read a lot of ancient history and occasionally other periods. Um, it's especially cool to read history about countries and times that I know nothing about, uh, rather than the, you know, the same old stories that were taught uh, all through high school and college and such. Um, but one of the things I wanted to do when I started writing this series was to weld the, the uh, the wonder and, and imagination of the, of the very best fantasy and, and science fiction with some of the grittiness of historical fiction. In addition to history, I read a lot of historical fiction. And um, for me, it fulfills some of the same stuff with fantasies. It takes us to another place, another time, a place where mores were different. Um, and yet in historical fiction, there's, there's a, a sense of realism 
that uh, I found very attractive. Uh, and I'm a huge Tolkien fan. Certainly, he was a giant influence over me. Um, but fantasy in, in the hands of the imitators who followed Tolkien, I think, had kind of lost its way. They were, they were taking a lot of Tolkien's tropes and just repeating them. And they didn't have, Tolkien was a real scholar and, and a linguist and uh, an expert in folklore and ancient languages. And he brought all of this considerable learning to it. That wasn't true of the Tolkien imitators. They were taking just the broadest, you know, castles and knights and, and, and dark lords and stuff from Tolkien and producing this stuff that seemed to be me to be set in the Disneyland Middle Ages uh, rather than anything approximating the real Middle Ages. So, so history, you know, was, was huge for me. And as I read a lot of history, you know, uh, there's that famous quote that if you steal from one person it's plagiarism, if you steal from many people it's research. Uh, <laughs> I, I stole from many people reading a lot of history and I, I would say to my wife as I read some of these histories, you can't make this stuff up, listen to what happened here. And I'd read some incredible incident and then, you know, I'd file off the serial numbers and uh, change a few things and uh, do a version of that for my books. So something like the Red Wedding, as I've said in other interviews, was very much inspired by the Black Dinner of Scotland and the Glencoe Massacre, both from Scotland. Scotland has a lot of incredibly bloody history, uh, which is uh, particularly, particularly good. Of course, the War of Roses was a huge influence over everything, the Hundred Years War. Um, all of that was, was Christopher the Mill. So in addition to historical references, do you believe, do you also think of uh, Song of Ice and Fire as, uh, as kind of relating to current? Does it function not only as historical reference in some ways, but political allegory, right, in the way that your work deals with issues of, you know, war and peace, uh, family loyalties or national divisions. How do you, you know, and there is a long history of science fiction and fantasy functioning as sort of historical allegory, political allegory. Do you, do you think your work functions in that way? Well, I, I think some of that is probably there, but it's not necessarily there deliberately. I, I think you're obviously you're influenced as a writer by the world you live in and uh, the things you see on the news and, and the forces that have shaped you from your childhood to that, all of that goes in and it comes out in some ways. But I'm not writing conscious allegory. Mm -hmm. Tolkien was accused of that, of course. It always made him very angry because he mm -hmm. hated allegory. Um, but, you know, he, when people said, well, the Lord of the Rings is an allegory for World War II, he, he rejected it vehemently. Um, but there's no doubt that I think some of that, um, mm -hmm. some of that is there. Yeah, some of this is just universal concerns. I mean, I'm writing about power, I'm writing about right. governance, I'm writing about war. Um, Yes, there are differences, but the things that are true about the war in Iraq are also true about Caesar's invasion of Gaul and, and Alexander's conquest of Persia. There are certain universals that, that, that go all through history, and uh, those are inevitably present. Mm -hmm. yeah, again, to George's, kind of continues on the issue of the political implications. So for all the enormous interest and lauding of your work, certainly deservedly so. There have also been some critiques, I'm sure you know, of the series, by which I mean both the book series and the TV series, political and social implications. Now, in many ways, we could say that the series really kind of undermine traditional notions of power, that, that they really, in some ways, very much play with, you know, as we've talked about, about phallic constructions of power, kind of subverting it. But at the same time, you know, there has been some critique of the works in terms of issues of gender and sexuality and race. So for example, with the TV series, it even led to the, con the coinage of a new term, sex position, right, which people talk about it, kind of laugh about the way that sometimes there'll be uh, these scenes with, with sexual activity or nudity to kind of prevent the information of narrative, kind of narrative information from seeming boring, that you have the sex going on. So some people say, okay, so women and sexual minorities are there for just kind of titillation purposes and not much else. And there have also been some critique of some of the racial tropes, for instance, using the trope of the kind of white savior of dark people, like in the case of Daenerys Targaryen. So I'm curious, do you think that these critiques are 
justified? How do you respond to those critiques? Well, you're, that question covers a lot of territory. Uh, Good time, the professor here. <laughs> there, there are. Uh, let me try to separate that into component parts here. First of all, you have to separate the books from the television right. show. They're, they're, they're two different things. Um, and sometimes it's, it's very, uh, very, very clear, as in the case of uh, this white savior business right. with the, the scene with Daenerys, um, where she is uh, hailed by the, uh, the slaves that she's just freed in the city of Yunkai. Um, that scene is drawn largely from the books, but in the, in the books, I, I think I make it very clear that uh, the slavery of uh, Slaver's Bay of Yunkai and Astapur and Marine is not racially based. Mm -hmm. It's not American um, slavery, uh, which was strictly race-based. It's modeled much more on the, the slavery of the ancient Near East of the Romans and the, and the Greeks. Uh, where slaves could be of any race, um, you know, it could just be the guys who lost the last war. Um, you know, the Greeks enslaved each other. You know, if Thebes defeated Athens in a war, a bunch of Athenians would suddenly be slaves in Thebes, and vice versa. Um, the Romans conquered people of various colors in Africa and and very different colors and colors in Germany and Gaul, and made slaves of them all. Um, and that's certainly what I depict in the books. Uh, and I think that's what is meant to be depicted in the TV show, too. But there are practicalities with running a TV show. Mm -hmm. those, those scenes were filmed in Morocco. Um, and the people that you see are extras mm -hmm. who are paid you know, $30 a day or something like that to, uh, to perform. Um, just to be in the background. Um, when you film that, you, the practicalities are you put out a call for extras and mm -hmm. people show up and, uh, and you sign up as many as you need. Um, when you do that in Morocco, Moroccans show up right. and... <laughs> So I don't know what the, I mean, obviously there's an implication there that uh, people took of it, perhaps people who had not read the books, yeah. um, that all of the people that she freed were, were brown or black, and that yeah. certainly not the, was not intended to be the case. But yeah. on the other hand, flying in people from, uh, um, from Ireland to, in order to yeah. people this scene in Morocco just to stand in the crowd would have been uh, very, very cost prohibitive. Yeah. These are the kind of practicalities of television yeah. uh, production that, that some critics never take into advantage. I mean, if you look at the Dothraki, for example, we, we filmed these Dothraki scenes with Daenerys in a number of different places. And, you know, like some of the early scenes, our, our main location is Belfast in Northern Ireland, and we film in areas around Belfast. Now, Danny in particular has filmed scenes in Morocco, in Malta. Uh, she's filming some in Spain right now. We, we move around, um, but some of the early Dothraki scenes when she was first with Khal Drogo were actually filmed in, in the fields outside Belfast in Northern Ireland yeah. in, in forests and grasslands. And if you look at those closely, there's a lot of kind of pasty white Dothraki yeah. uh, <laughs> because those are the guys who showed up when we put a yeah. casting call. Hey, do you have long hair? Can you ride a horse? And, uh, you know, you hire who you show up. And with gen I mean, that scene, you know, with, with Daenerys too, I mean, it ties to the gender issues. I know what you're saying about the differences between the TV show and the book, that it's very different, let's say, the issues of sexual violence that are in the TV program are not like the scene, you know, that is not a rape of, of Danny in, in your book. And I know that, so I, I understand exactly what you're saying about the, 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 between the difference between the television and, but as a, you know, but you're also an executive producer of the TV series. Do you have, can you kind of negotiate those things with them? Or, you know, how does that work to say, I, I don't like the way you're, you're translating this? You know, I'm involved in a television show, but it's, it's really run by David Benioff and, and mm -hmm. Dan Weiss. Um, 
you know, and I don't consult every day. I'm not, I'm not in Belfast. I'm, I'm uh, mm -hmm. you know, in Santa Fe trying to, half a world away trying to finish my books. So I do consult with them. They, we talk regularly. They sometimes ask my opinions and sometimes they don't. Um, but I don't think in, the, in that particular case I would have done anything different. I mean, they, frankly, it, I don't even think I realized there was a problem there until people started pointing out there was a problem. Maybe that's my blindness or the blindness of David and Dan, but it was just, you know, the, the practicalities if you're going to do that scene. I mean, how do you, how do you get that? Where, where do you get the, the mixed racial things when you're trying to hire a thousand extras for a scene mm -hmm. and you're doing it in Morocco? I, I, I don't know. You know, do you use CGI to, to change their complexion or uh, mm -hmm. do, you know, do you say we have enough brown people? Sorry, we're not hiring any more of you brown people. Uh, you know, brown people. Uh, only white people should. I, I don't know. I don't know how you, how you do that. but. Uh, I don't know. Maybe there is a better way, and we should have thought about it more, but uh, I don't know that. Now, let me go to another part of that question, which is the sex position question. That was a, that was a very <laughs> cool uh, coinage, mm -hmm. uh, which was coined by, uh, I think it was Miles Nutt, the yes, critic it was. Miles Nutt, yeah. for referring to a, one particular scene. Yeah. Um, and I, th I think it was probably justified for that particular scene. Littlefinger is giving a long speech in the brothel, and meanwhile there's, there's right. a, a couple girls getting it on in the background. And, uh, <laughs> and it was parodied on Saturday Night Live and all that. But I, I do think that, like many of these tropes that uh, Odie's Cornish has come forward, it's, it's been ma vastly misused. People who don't seem to un actually understand the scene have started applying it to any scene that has sex. Mm -hmm. I don't think sexuality is sex position. Mm -hmm. um, you know, s sex position was that one particular right. thing where they're trying to put something, um, I guess, visually interesting on, on, right. on the scene while, they're, while someone is delivering, a, you know, a long nugget of uh, backstory. Right. Um, George, let me, let, let me come at this from a different way because there's another side to your characters, another side to what you're doing. As you illuminate in your Rolling Stone interview from, a, from maybe about a year ago, you deride the fact that fantasy is mostly inundated with evil, ugly, dark lords who, who go to battle with dashing, brave heroes. And you've kind of turned that paradigm upside down. I'm going to have a follow-up to Tom on this in a second. Your books feature a dwarf as, as a major character, if not the, the sole, the most reasonable voice, a disabled boy, um, many of the characters, uh, a, a prostitute plays, uh, several seem to be wise and heroic. You have a character who commits in the first book and the first season of the show an irredeemable act who is now in the, since he's lost a, a limb, is becoming almost, I, I, I hesitate to say heroic and yet that's what it is. Um, you seem to have changed the nature of heroism as it has been traditionally defined in fantasy and science fiction. Is that something you set out to do consciously or did, just, did, or did it evolve? Did characters like Tyrion Bran um, and Jamie Lannister, did they just evolve organically? You know, I think it's a little bit of both. Um, I've always been attracted to great characters. Um, I think they're more interesting than, uh, than heroes, you know, who are just going around being heroic all the time. Is that why, by taking Jamie's hand away, he becomes a more sympathetic character and, and seeks redemption instead of continuing on the path he was on before? Well, he certainly has to redefine himself, and, and in that comes a lot of personal anguish and, and personal growth and personal struggle, all of which is you know, great material for, uh, for drama. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I grew up as a comic book fan, as I mentioned. That was my, my first stuff was published in comic fanzines. And uh, a huge influence on me when I was like 10, 11, 12 years old was, was uh, Stan Lee and the Marvel comics. And that was one of the things he did, you know. I'd, I'd been reading DC Comics for years when Marvel started. And uh, the DC stories were all completely circular, you know. Was, Batman was swinging around Gotham City and, you know, here comes the Riddler or the Joker. And he defeats the Riddler and the Joker and they go in. But there's never any surprises. The story ends right where it begins so next week he can deal with Poison Ivy or whatever. And um, you always knew who the heroes were. You always knew who the villains were. Um, 
and Stan Lee th threw all that out. He, That's right. He, 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 you know, the Fantastic Four, what a revelation that was in 1961. You know, one of, one of the guys on the team was a monster. And he didn't like being a monster, and he was angry at the other people on the team. They were fighting within each other, just as League never fought within each other. And I discovered really the, the powers of conflict and the powers of great characters, and they continue to, I mean, I love Lord of the Rings, and I think Boromir is my favorite character. He's the one who, who succumbs, you know? He's a mm. hero, but he's also fatally flawed, and, uh, you know, he, he fails at the last moment, and, and, you know, you're rooting for him, but then, uh, and Peter Jackson did a great job in the movie, was showing his temptation, you really, you really like Boromir, but, you know, then he turns against Frodo, corrupted by the ring, but then he dies so heroically, full of arrows, yeah, Sean Bean dying one of his many deaths. Jesus. Uh, <laughs> So I love to write about characters like that, and intellectually, I always, I also, I also find the question of, of redemption fascinating. Maybe it's, you know, I'm not religious now, but I was raised a Catholic, so maybe it's, maybe it's uh, questions that, I, uh, that come to me from my whole Catholic upbringing and the, the things I learned from uh, nice. Sister Mary Elephant or something in catechism. <laughs> I, I mean, you know, the, the whole question of forgiveness for sin, you know, that the Catholic Church teaches you go to confession and you are forgiven for your sins, even terrible sins. Um, but certainly our society doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily deal with that. Uh, we, we, we don't forgive people. Even I don't forgive people. I recognize, you know, I'm a great character myself here, I, you know. As some of you know, follow my, my uh, blog. I'm a, I'm a football fan. I'm a, I'm a fan of the Giants and the Jets. But it, it bothers me that Michael Vick is on, my, is on my Jets team. And I know he's paid his debt to society and all that, but I can't just bring myself to root for this guy. You know, uh, so, uh, you know, and, and then um, people yeah. say, well, what about your belief in redemption? Well, yeah, I know, but <laughs> it's still, it's hard. It's hard. You know, Tom, what, what we were sort of. Actually, to I should. Try to I should talk about the next book. I should tell you that uh, uh, I actually have three books coming out this month, so uh, none of them are the winds of winter, but uh, <laughs> we do have uh, The Ice Dragon, uh, which uh, my, my children, children's book, uh, which has an older book, but it's just been reissued by Tor in hardcover. Beautiful new edition with artwork by Louis Royale, and that came out a couple days ago. And The Dangerous Women paperback, the first volume, because it's a really big book and hardcover. That comes out uh, when? That comes out in a few days, right? Actually, that is shipping now. It will be shipping in some now. stores. Okay. <laughs> and then on October 28th, uh, The World of Ice and Fire comes out, a giant, heavily illustrated coffee table book from Bantam Spectra hardcover um, with all of the background and information about Westeros, art on every page, gorgeous art and uh, tons of uh, history uh, about... You can read the Armageddon Rag. And yeah, you can read the Armageddon Rag too. You can be one of the 12. <laughs> so <laughs> no, that's in print now. All my old books have come back in print, so uh, you can get them, but they're not coming out this month. So what we wanted to do to try, because I know a lot of people have questions. So first of all, try to keep your questions relatively brief. What we wanted to do was hear, a question, hear questions from both sides. In other words, you ask and you ask. So they hear both questions. Starks, because, Lannisters. <laughs> because sometimes Lannisters. No other way. <laughs> All right, Let's get Lannister. So we're going to hear both questions first because sometimes questions sure. overlap and then they'll no, answer and Stark then we'll move on. So, Lannister. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. Um, have you or yeah? Have you um, read anything that made you think differently about fantasy or science fiction, either or both? Okay, and your question would be... And my question is, you have such a brilliantly realized world, but you've also called yourself more of a gardener as a writer, so I guess my question is, how much of Westeros was planned as a setting prior to even the beginning of the first draft? Uh, almost none. I mean, when that first chapter came to me, I, I didn't know what I had. I knew it didn't fit the, the science fiction novel I was presently writing. Um, so I knew it was in some fantasy, but I didn't have a name for it, and I, I didn't know anything. But I continued to write the first few chapters. At some point, I stopped and drew, drew a map. That's kind of, I knew when I was doomed. 
uh, when I drew the first map. But uh, I am a gardener rather than an architect, and, and uh, the, the world has grown together with the, with the story. Um, there are times I almost wish, uh, some of you have probably read Gene Wolfe, the absolutely brilliant science fiction and fantasy writer from, from Chicago, author of the, uh, the oh, many books, Book of the New Sun, and uh, was one of his best. And that started as a trilogy, ended up in four books. I was in a writer's group with Gene when he was writing that. And Gene had a full-time job as an as a editor for a, a technical magazine. And he wrote all four of those books in first draft before he submitted any of it to the publisher. And then having finished all four books, he went back and revised the first one, you know, put in some foreshadowing of things that had happened in the fourth book that he didn't know when he was writing the first book, eliminating loose ends that led nowhere, you know, just making them. And that's really the way to write a long series. But, uh, you know, and, and as part of me that, you know, if I had, if I had been a billionaire with a huge trust fund, uh, I might have done that, but then none of you would have read any of the books because I'd, I'd still be working in book five and Game of Thrones wouldn't be released yet because I'd be holding it to go back uh, when I finished all seven. So, uh, you know, but it, it grows, it, for me, it grows, the world grows along with the stuff. I did have to, when putting together this world book, The World of Ice and Fire, uh, really focus in and I invented a lot of new material for that, a lot of background that. The, uh, the fans and readers had sent me emails and letters about, you guys are insatiable. I mean, it's, it, it's like, you know, I, I do a family tree with like eight generations, and then like a week later I get, well, who was, who was the father before that first generation? <laughs> I mean, am I supposed to go back to the West Coast, Adam and Eve? I don't know, I guess so, but. <laughs> and did, did, yeah. Um, did, did you have an answer for, did, did you want to reiterate? Yeah, uh, <laughs> sorry. Have you read anything, both of you, um, that uh, made you think differently about fantasy? Um, I've read a lot of great fantasy. I think this is a golden age for, uh, for fantasy. I mean, uh, we have a lot of wonderful new fantasists. Daniel Abraham with The Dagger and the Coin, Patrick Rothfuss, Scott Lynch, uh, Joe Abercrombie. These are all writers that I really, really, really like and, and uh, admire. Um, so they're doing some amazing stuff. Yeah, Tom, and from your from thing, things that's happening in, in uh, both fantasy and science fiction right now, um, is we're we're seeing a lot of new writers coming into the field, um, who are from a different cultural and ethnic background. Uh, you know, people who are Asian or African American or or just African or or. Um, you know, from many different cultures, and they're drawing on, you know, it's often been pointed that a lot of epic fantasy has its roots, like Tolkien, in, in the European Middle Ages or the European Dark Ages, and that's certainly been true of the overwhelming amount of material, but I, I think that's starting to break down, and we're, we're getting some interesting books by some interesting writers. Look at the people being nominated for the Campbell Award the last few years, uh, much broader, so we're getting more diversity into the field now. Whether that is going to succeed or not, um, some of that is up to the writers and how good those books are. But a lot of it is also up to you. Um, you know, are you going to support these writers? Are you going to buy their books and review their books and mm -hmm. and uh, create the, the blurb about their books? And if so, we're going to have an explosion, I think, of of fantasy that's uh, much more much more diverse and and maybe it won't seem quite so familiar. I mean, I, I base my work on the history that I knew, the history that I was taught and that I'd read numerous about, like War of the Roses and all that. I don't know a huge amount about Asian history. Um, someone coming in, drawing from a Japanese perspective or an Indian perspective, uh, um, would produce something very different. And I, I look forward to reading books like that. And I think we're gonna, we're gonna get a lot more of that moving forward. All right, all right let's hear Thank the next you. set of questions from the next people. The Starks in the land. The Starks. Hi. Um, after having worked on the TV series, do you find that when you're writing, you you have images from the show of what the characters look like or the places look like, or is it entirely separate in your mind? 
That's a great question. And your question would be? Um, my question was, you admitted you really like your great characters. I was wondering if it's easy for you as an author to kind of kill off or let go of black oh. and white characters. <laughs> They're pure good or pure evil. Are they somehow a little bit uh, easier to maybe write and easier to bump great. off? Great. Those are kind of connected. Want to get both of those? Um, I, I, I do get attached to my characters, and sometimes it is hard to kill them off. Uh, I've, I've said before that the Red Wedding was the hardest thing I ever wrote. I finished that entire book, and I had to skip over that chapter. I couldn't write that chapter until the rest of the book was finished. Wow. I, okay, now I've got to go back and finally write that chapter, and I, I made myself write it, but it was painful. These mm -hmm. characters assume a certain reality to me, mm -hmm. and on the same token there, uh, no, the TV show does not affect my images of the characters. I recognize that it does so for you for the readers and the viewers. Uh, you probably see, when you read the books, you see Peter Dinklage. When you read Tyrion, you see Maisie Williams. When you read Arya, and they're both sensational at their parts, as are many of our cast. But you gotta remember, I've been living with these characters since um, 1991. And we had the first meeting about the TV show in 2007, so there were, there were 16 years that I was living and writing about those characters in that world before the TV show was even a, a, a twinkle in, in the eye of HBO. So uh, that's too deeply rooted to replace it for me. Great. All right, next up from folks. Um, so one of the most great and terrible things about A Song of Ice and Fire is its unpredictability. So how has the expanded reader base affected your ability to keep up uh, that sense of excitement or um, sort of the ability to predict or not predict things that are going to happen in the series? And for, for George, I know you don't uh, directly are involved with the, the goings on with the show right now, but I just wanted to get your opinion on exactly how the show has deviated from your own writings and how well you think that should continue or not continue. I always think of Tyrion's nose when, I, when, I, when someone asks that question. So that, predictable. Tyrion's nose is a good example. I mean, yeah, they didn't cut off his nose. Uh, I, I can write that, you know, that, Yes, and they cut off his nose, and then I can make references in the subsequent books to him having half a nose or having a big scar and to how it itches and he scratches it. That's relatively easy for me to do. Actually, cutting off Peter Dinklage's nose uh, was prohibited by the Actors Guild. Uh, <laughs> so we were, we were stuck with, uh, well, if we wanted to do that, we would have to essentially put a piece of green screen, uh, a little green uh, kind of thing on the end of his nose that he would have to wear in all of his scenes, and then we could CGI every moment he appeared, uh, you know, the, the nose scar, um, and that was just way too expensive. Yes. I mean, it's the practicalities of, uh, yeah. uh, of doing it again. Uh, you know, a lot of the changes that occur between a, a movie or a television show or book are, are dictated by practical considerations like that, questions of budget and shooting time and what can be done and uh, what, what can't be done. Um, and I'm already forgetting the other question. I'm sorry, my mind is a sieve here. How the expanded reader base has affected your ability to write things that are unpredictable? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, I'm not sure it's the expanded reader base that has uh, affected things so much as the internet. But basically, I have, to, I have to divorce myself from the internet. I mean, I know it's out there, and I know people have theories, and sometimes at venues like this, people come up and tell me their theories. Uh, don't do that. Uh, <laughs> but the truth is, when you're, when you're, when you're writing a, a book, um, you know, that has any kind of surprises or mysteries, you know, you lay in certain clues that, let us say, the butler did it. And um, it's a long series. You, you lay in the clues in the first one, and you have more clues, and maybe a few red herrings and subsequent ones. Mm -hmm. And most readers will not miss that. They will, they will not figure out who did it. They will not even be cognizant there's a mystery, or they will put together the clues wrong. But there will always be some, and this has always been true, there will always be some who put the clues together and figure out that the butler did it. What's changed in the eyes of the internet is now 
that smart ass feels that they can go on the internet and say, oh, here are the seven clues that I found and see the butler did it. <laughs> so if you're a writer and you're aware of that, then you have, what do you do? Now your surprise is ruined because suddenly this person has put it out and now thousands of people have read it. And they're all saying, oh yeah, you're right, I didn't see that, but yeah, the butler did do it. So you can change the subsequent books Very and the butler didn't do it now. Now the, the chambermaid did it, but but then all your clues that you put in so carefully in the first and second book lead to nowhere, and they're, they're, they're contradictions. So I, I don't do that. I, you know, I'm sorry, but the butler is still going to do it at the end, and <laughs> some people will have figured that out, I, I think, and other people who didn't figure it out will know it because they read it on the internet in one of these theory-swapping things, and there's no help for that. Uh, there's a structure to the things that you have to be true to. Um, I console myself in the fact that I, I do have millions of readers, and as, as big and noisy as the internet seems, it's still relatively small in the cosmic theme of things. So there will be, at the end, there will still be many, many thousands of people who will be shocked to find out that the butler did it. <laughs> <laughs> All right, next set. Uh, this one is also for George. Um, whenever you... <laughs> Sorry. Um, we have whenever some questions for Tom here. <laughs> He's getting off easy. <laughs> um, right, some Tom folks come up and get in line. Whenever you, um, if you do, hit bumps in the road or roadblocks with character plots or like traits or whatever, um, how much of that do you draw from your personal life in order to create a more in-depth character or scene or relationship? Okay. Yours is. Um, a Song of Ice and Fire is a very, very long, well, it's a fairly long-running series of very long novels, and people who read these, who have been reading these novels since the beginning have developed a kind of a feeling, I feel they must have developed a, series, a feeling of trust that you're going to be leading them to somewhere that ultimately has a very good payoff. Do you feel that with the immense number of people you kill per book that you could <laughs> violate that trust? <laughs> immense. So those go together, you know, in terms of the pers your personal experiences and then also the personal feelings of the readers, so. Well, I hope I don't violate that trust, but, uh, you know, I, I, I've kind of become accustomed to the fact that some people probably will think I have by the time we reach the end. You know, it, it's, a, it's a phenomenon of a, of a, of a long-running series like this when, you know, people start noticing it with the first book or the second book or the third book and then, then they love those books and the fourth book's not out yet and they start anticipating the fourth book and they, this platonic ideal of what that fourth book is going to be develops in their head and then they get the actual fourth book and many people are happy with it but then there's always going to be a percentage of readers who are not happy with it because it didn't go the way they thought it was going to go or it wasn't as, as whatever it was they thought it was so you, you inevitably come come on that with the series. But I certainly want to try to uh, stick the ending as, uh, as best I can. Um, it's not easy. I mean, I'm not going to name names here, but we, over dinner we were discussing some other writers and, and you know, some very, very good writers have a real problem with endings. Endings can be, can be tough, you know, especially for big, sprawling things. You pull out a lot of stuff. As for the question about, uh, yes, um, you do draw on your personal experience to make characters come alive to, to some extent. Um, that's, that's where the inner life comes from. That, that's where the human heart and conflict with self comes from. Um, I was very threatened as a kid uh, when I knew I wanted to be a writer by the stuff you always read in like how to write books and things like only write about what you know. Um, because I wanted to write science fiction and fantasy, and I, I didn't really know about being a prince or an astronaut or, you know, I was this kid from New Jersey, and we, we, we were poor, we didn't even own a car. I, I, my, my world was five blocks long, and I was saying, oh God, do I have to write about a guy who lives in Bayonne in the projects and <laughs> walks to school every day five blocks long? But um, what I discovered is that what you know it's not the mundane details of uh, you know where you live and and what it is, but it's it's what you know is about life, about love, about about uh, heroism and cowardice and and 
these issues of what it's like to be human and, and you have to you have to draw on yourself to do that. Yeah, you can draw on other things too. You read you read, you know, characters from history and you read people in the news and you have friends and relatives and guys guys you went to school with and girls you went to school with and you can base characters on all of them to some extent, at least externally, but you only know those people unless you're a telepath and, and you don't look like a telepath to me. You, you don't really know what's going beyond the behind these these masks. The only one you really know is yourself. And, uh, you know, I think to be a significant writer, there's a, a, you have to be willing to kind of expose yourself and, and uh, dig, dig deep and, you know, as Harlan Ellison would say, bleed on the paper or something like that. And that's a lesson I learned early on that's, uh, that stood me in, in good stead. Um, I write a lot of, about a lot of characters and none of them are kids from Bayonne. Uh, so obviously I'm not writing about what I know in that sense. I, I, I've never been an exiled princess. I've never been an eight-year-old girl. I've never been a dwarf. Um, but there's a lot of me in all those characters. I mean, it's, you know, I, I think what would, what would it be like if I was an eight-year-old girl in Arya's situation? What would it be like if I was, if I was Daenerys Targaryen or Tyrion Lannister? How would it feel? And I, I do put a lot of myself into that. Thank you. Okay, so next set, uh, can I just say too, if anybody has a question for Tom, come to the front of the line. Mm -hmm. but, yes. <laughs> um, before I ask my question, Mr. Martin, I'd really like to thank you for writing the books. They've had a huge impact on my life, Mom, so thank you. Um, my question is, how do you think that the success of the entire A Song of Ice and Fire universe has influenced the way that you're writing the future books? Okay. Hi, um, I have two questions. The first one's really quick. Um, first, what are your favorite house words? Um, and then also, um, I assume you quickly developed a final outcome for the story after originally creating it. Uh, but at some points, you also made changes like uh, the inclusion of like a five-year gap. Um, so I was wondering if there were any other major deviations or character choices that you made and later thought better of. Uh, my favorite house words are definitely winter is coming. That's the one I... I write, uh, you know, repeatedly uh, when I'm uh, when I used to do inscriptions uh, on signed books. Um, I haven't actually gotten to the end yet, so I don't know if there are going to be other major changes. It's it's possible, but I, I don't. I think the broad outlines are going to remain the same. You know, I I know where some of the major characters are going, how they're going to end up, how it's going to resolve. But there are a, the devil is in the details, and there's a lot of stuff that occurs when you're actually writing the, the books. I don't know, you, you dealt with some of this, uh, I'm, I'm you and Harriet, with, with Jordan, I'm sure. Uh, Jim always said that he, he knew the last scene yep. uh, when, he, wow. when he started. So did. Did he entrust that to Harriet, and did Brandon write the last scene that, that uh, Jim had originally envisioned? Yeah, he did, yeah. yeah. And that was like 20 years later, right? 20 years later. But of course, then he was thinking it was going to be a trilogy. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I'm sorry, I'm You're already forgetting the first question. Yeah. I, I keep forgetting there's two questions at a time. I, I'm old and, and feeble, so. <laughs> How do you that? think the uh, success of the entire universe has influenced the way that you write the future novels? Um, I don't think it's influenced the way I write the future novels, but it's, it, it's certainly been a distraction. I probably would have written the novels faster if I wasn't like always approving things or going on tours or uh, you know doing coming to Brown doing other coming to Brown uh, yeah <laughs> to to do that I mean there's just there's just a lot of other things and you know some of it is is good stuff it's stuff I enjoy enjoy doing I know there's a subset of my fans that would like to just chain me to the typewriter uh, <laughs> And if no one was giving me awards or in offering me free trips to, to Dubai and, and uh, South Africa, maybe, you know, maybe I would do that. But at, when I actually settle down and, and write you know, between these trips here, and I mean, I'm trying to, I swear I'm trying to cut down on all of this. But when I'm actually there writing, um, it, it's, it's like time vanishes. And I'm, I'm, back, I'm back once again in, in uh, Westeros. And 
the real world disappears and uh, days and weeks go by and I, I don't do anything else except live and breathe those characters and it's that's still pretty much the same process. Everything vanishes, including the show. As uh, much as I love the show, it's, it's different from the books. And um, so it's the books and the, the characters as I interpreted them that take over my life. Guest and our interviewers. Somebody started an argument online recently. I got an email about it, about uh, you know if uh, if Drogon could beat Smog. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, no. Drogon Drogon is a very young dragon and still you know barely large enough to to get Danny into the sky. <laughs> Thank you, Laura. <laughs> thank you all, and thank you for that uh, kind introduction, Laura. So let's start talking about this new book, um, The World of Ice and Fire. Um, I've been telling people who ask me about it that it's sort of the Silmarillion of your imaginary world. Um, and you wrote it with a couple of co-authors, so I'd, I'd love to hear you talk about whether it is the Silmarillion of the known world and, um, and about what it was like to work with Elio and Linda. Well, um, this is a book that really began with my readers and my fans. Um, of course, in any epic fantasy, um, the world is a character. Setting is, uh, is very important. And that, I think, has certainly been true since J.R. Tolkien and Lord of the Rings. Uh, of course, fantasy goes back to ancient times, the, the Iliad, the Odyssey, the Ballad of Gilgamesh. Um, but Tolkien really invented modern epic fantasy in its current form. And, and one of the things he did that was extraordinary was create Middle-earth in such detail. If you look at some of the pre-Tolkien fantasy, it's, it's written more in the story of fairy tales. You know, Once upon a time, there was a king, and the king had a beautiful daughter, and there was an evil vizier. And they may have names, but you won't know like who was the king's father or who was his grandfather or how the dynasty came to power or how long it's ruled or what the neighboring countries are. It's, it's, it's all told in this fairy tale thing. Tolkien gave us all these histories, uh, all these appendices and genealogies and uh, um, everything was, was rooted and it, it seemed as real as England or France or Germany when you when you read these things. And since then, that's become the style for epic fantasy. It's something a fantasy readers now expect. They expect a, a fully realized secondary world, as Tolkien called it. And so certainly that's what I uh, set out to create in, in Westeros. Now some of this is a magician's trick. It, it really wasn't with Tolkien. Um, you have to consider that Tolkien is, uh, was a very, very unusual writer. I mean, he was a linguist and a philosopher, and, a, and a, he spoke Old Norse and Old English. He was fascinated by myth. You know, he, he, the story was almost secondary to Tolkien. He spent years creating his Cimmerillion, never published it in his lifetime. And Lord of the Rings and The Hobbit were like stories set in the world he created, but for him, the world creation and the creation of languages was almost primary. Um, if you look at it like an iceberg, he, uh, you know, they say the three quarters of an iceberg is hidden below the, below the surface. That was certainly true with Tolkien. With a lot of the fantasists who have followed Tolkien, though, it's a magician's trick. We have some ice on a raft, and we, <laughs> we want you to think that there's this huge edifice <laughs> underneath, just like with Tolkien, but there really isn't in, in some cases. 
And that was probably true with me in the beginning. I mean, I began with the story and the characters and the scene and everything grew from that. But the world grew along with the story. And I rapidly discovered as I got into the writing that the readers wanted to know more and more about this world. Um, and they would send me emails and letters saying, this, this dance with the dragons that you mentioned, who, can you tell me more about that? It sounds fascinating. Aegon's conquest, how did Aegon conquer the seven kingdoms when you know, he only had a little army? You mentioned that, but I don't understand how it worked. Could you, could you write me about that? Or could you write a book about that? And, and you know, as the years passed, a lot of these letters <laughs> came in. And some of the earliest ones came in from Elio and Linda, Elio Garcia Jr. Um, and Linda Ann Thompson. Elio is, uh, is an American who uh, lives in Sweden with his, uh, his uh, Swedish girlfriend, Linda, and uh, they uh, were among the earliest fans to get in touch with me way back in the, in the middle 90s, and they wanted to run a game, and they had a million questions, and they displayed right away an almost obsessive knowledge of my world. Uh, <laughs> In fact, I had to alter my world because of that obsessive knowledge. Uh, when, uh, you know, I, in, in one of the earliest appendices that I created was, well, who were the kings who came before King Robert, who was king? We know that King Robert had usurped his throne from the Mad King, but, and before that there had been Aegon the Conqueror and the Targaryen Conquest. Well, who were all the kings in between? So I invented a bunch of kings' names and... <laughs> Dates, and I put that in the back of the first edition of Game of Thrones. And I had, you know, well, this is the first son of the second son, the, you know, this is the younger brother of. <laughs> and everything was fine there until uh, I wrote uh, the uh, Duncan Egg story. The first Duncan Egg story, The Hedge Knight, uh, which was set 100 years before um, the main Ice and Fire story. This is a set of, I, just in case anybody is not familiar with these, is, is three short stories. Uh, three novellas three so novellas. far, but there will be more, yeah. That, and it, it's, set, uh, it's set 90 years before the events of A Song of Ice and Fire. And I had some Targaryens in that. And Elio and Linda looked at the date that that was set in and compared <laughs> it to the date and they look at, oh, this guy, you say in the Hedge Knight that this guy is like 35 years old, but uh, that, you know, if you compare it to the dates given in the, in the chronology that you had in book one, he can't possibly be older than seven. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> because of how old were these people when they had the children and all that. And I went through all these dates and, and damned if he wasn't right. So I... <laughs> I had to change the list of Targaryen kings, and someone who had previously been a son now became a younger brother. So, so all the dates would, <laughs> all the dates would work. But that impressed me right there that Elio and Linda really knew this stuff. So, fast forward uh, as the years go by, I got more and more requests for for something like this, a concordance or a world book. A number of other fantasy authors had had done these, you know, this the so and so companion or the concordance or whatever. Um, I said, okay, we'll, we'll do one too, um, and I'll, I'll have Elio and Linda come in, and, and they can do all the hard work, uh, <laughs> because they keep track of the stuff better than, uh, better than I am. And uh, we, we signed a contract back in 2008, I think it was. It was supposed to be delivered in, you know, a couple years. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> we know how that works. Uh, <laughs> And like many of my projects, it got, uh, not only did it get, become late, but it got much bigger than it initially, uh, initially had begun. And I wound up creating a lot more material. You know, the initial approach was uh, Elio and Linda were gonna go through the whole book and uh, they were gonna, uh, all of the published books and even some of the unpublished manuscripts at that point, and they were gonna organize all the historical references and you know, kind of beat out a, a, an outline in a rough draft, which they would then send to me, and I would polish that and revise that and, and fill it out, and I would fill in the gaps, because there, inevitably there would be big gaps where I didn't say anything. Um, and we were gonna have a history and a, a who's who. Um, and we started working on that. Elio and Linda really started working on the who's who. And the who's who got so gigantically big with like thousands of characters that we said, hmm, we, 
we have like half a million words of who's who. So, so we took that out and we put that on the app. Uh, so that's, that's the World of Ice and Fire app, and you can find all the, all the who's who's here, everybody who's ever walked on stage and, and said, you know, ouch, I'm wounded. Uh, we'll, be, <laughs> we'll be mentioned there in the who's who. But, and then we concentrated on, on this, which is a book of history and legends, and, and uh, I also wanted it to be beautiful. I'd looked at some of these other books uh, that had been done, and some of them were pretty nice looking, but others were not. Um, in fact, it was, I, I won't mention names, but there's one prominent fantasy writer whose own fans call his concordance the, the big book of bad art. Uh, so I was determined that my book not be, have bad art. I wanted great art, lots of art, art on every page, uh, a coffee table book heavily illustrated. By, by some of the top fantasy illustrators in the world, and, and that's what we, we set out to get, and that's what we got. I, people like Magali Villeneuve and, and uh, Ted Naismith and Mark Simonetti, Michael Comark. Um, we used a lot of art from Fantasy Fight Games, which has generated some wonderful art for the uh, Game of Thrones um, card game and board game, uh, and it is always finding some great artists from around the world for us. So, uh, you know, all of that was, was very exciting. Um, as usual, it, it grew bigger than anticipated. Uh, our initial budget uh, was that we were supposed to provide them with 50,000 words of text. And uh, the rest would all be art. You know, and it would be a, a nice book. Um, Elio and Linda, by the time they finished their portion of the thing, provided me with 70,000 words of text, <laughs> just working on the stuff in there. And then I was supposed to add some sidebars, um, filling in gaps. And, you know, I did with things I knew about history that I that I'd already made up the stories and the characters, and I knew kind of how they worked, but I hadn't found a place to put them in the novels. I'll put them in here as sidebars. So I wrote like 300,000 words of sidebars. <laughs> uh, so at that point, my editor's head exploded. Uh, <laughs> You know, Jan is somewhere in the audience. You'll recognize her by her exploded head. Uh, and it was pointed out that we couldn't actually publish this book. You know, we, I wanted art in every page, and we had all this art that we bought and paid for, but if we put in all these words, then the art would be like well, a picture every 10 pages. So we had to sort of get back to at least closer to the original concept. So uh, we wound up actually abridging many of my sidebars, and... Uh, so what, what, what you're saying, so Elia and Linda worked on that and Anne worked on that, and we got basically the outline of the, of, of the histories and stuff in there, but not the fully detailed versions that I wrote. So when you say, is this your, your, your Cimmerillion, the answer is, well, kind of, but no, because I'm going to take all those sidebars and, you know, write more sidebars, <laughs> and somewhere down the line, the full versions of all this stuff will be published, and we've been calling that the Grimmerillion. Uh, <laughs> that's mostly about the Targaryen kings and the whole history of Westeros. That's, that's really the focus of that book, so will be focused on the Targaryens. This book has a shorter version of that in, but it also has the regional histories of all of the, each of the regions of Westeros and the noble houses, and it has a lot of material about the nine free cities and the civilizations of Essos and the Summer Islands and even some stuff about the Basic Islands and the further east and the furthest east and um, et cetera, et cetera. So a lot, of, uh, a lot of great stuff, I hope. I hope you guys enjoy it. It was a lot of fun to write, I'll tell you that much. It's the kind of uh, book where if you love books that have maps in them, but you're obsessed with things that are on the edges of the maps, there's a, there, you'll get a lot of satisfaction from this. But um, also, in-depth history of some of the situations that, you know, if, you're, if you've read the book and you're, or, and, you, and you're watching the show and you're like, wait, where is the arbor again? You know, if you're <laughs> one of those readers, this is really great. But you're sometimes like that. I mean, don't you sometimes use 
um, Ilio as, as, a, as your kind of reference work for your own? Yes, I do. He, he really does have a frighteningly uh, exhaustive knowledge of, uh, of my world and my characters. So, uh, you know, <laughs> when, I, when I write a new chapter, it saves me time rather than going back and checking all the details. I just <laughs> send it to Elio and say, did I contradict anything I said in a previous book in this one? And he wrote, yes, you did. This character, you know, you killed three books. Oh, okay. <laughs> Graham, thanks for reminding me of that. Uh, <laughs> I've read some interviews with you where someone asks you a question, you go, oh, I don't remember, where's Elio when I did? <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so we have some of the images, and um, let's see, uh, okay. I'm gonna ask you some questions related to the images. This is Aegon the Conqueror upon Balerion the, Bra the Black Dread, um, and the artist is Jordi Gonzalez Escamilla, is that correct? If, you, if I get the pronunciation wrong, you're going to have to correct me. Uh, well, I can't really read the signature, but uh, <laughs> if you say so, no. okay. All right. All right. So, but it's, um, it's pretty cool. It's one of my favorite pieces yeah. in, in the book, and it captures, uh, okay. I think, the, the size of, uh, of uh, Balerion pretty, uh, pretty accurately. Somebody started an argument online recently. I got an email about it, about, uh, you know, if... Uh, if Drogon could beat Smog. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, as competitive as I am, uh, and, and I would like my guys to win, uh, basically, no, Drogon, Drogon is a very young dragon and still, you know, barely large enough to, to get Danny into the sky. You know, pretty formidable, and the smog is <laughs> gigantic. Not to mention the fact that smog like talks, and uh, <laughs> would probably have an intellectual advantage there. <laughs> but Balerion could could give smog some trouble. Uh, they're they're um, they're more equivalent in the in the size and ferocity uh, department. On the other hand, smog would still have that talking thing going. But uh, <laughs> I, I don't know how much a difference that takes makes. That's a question I hadn't thought to ask. <laughs> um, so talk a little bit about the Targaryens. They're not, they're relative newcomers to Westeros. Yes, um, you know, the Targaryens are of Valerian descent and the freehold of Valeria was the, you know, the superpower of my, my world for hundreds of years. Uh, there were sorcerer lords there who, who controlled certain dark magics, blood magic, and uh, fire magic, pyromancy. And um, one of the things they had was dragons, and uh, there were great dragon lord families that uh, bred and controlled dragons and, and flew them into battle, and they, they competed for primacy um, within a structure not dissimilar to the Roman Republic, where, you know, a certain number of great families controlled everything, and uh, most of the rest of the known world could not stand against the Valerians. Even when they had larger armies, uh, the Valerian advantage of dragons was, was too great to uh, overcome. But um, 400 years ago, uh, the doom came the doom of Valeria, and the entire um, freehold of Valeria was, was wiped out overnight. Um, and the dragon lords and hundreds of dragons with it. Uh, the Targaryens had been one of the, the families, one of the oligarchy, but they had had a premonition that something like this had come, and they had resettled to the Dragonstone Island off the coast of Westeros. Um, sometime before the, the doom came to Valeria and thereby avoided that and, and it, it left them after a relatively short period with the only effective dragons in the, in the world and Aegon and his sisters used uh, three of those dragons to uh, conquer the, the Seven Kingdoms of Westeros. The, um, the doom of Valeria, is not, it's not really clear from the book exactly what causes it. It sounds like it's a, it's a bunch of volcanic explosions or something like that, but 
but that's part of the sort of conceit of the book is that it's written by a Westerosi scholar of some kind and he's um, right. He's just he's working with these imperfect sources. There, there are actually we we took the conceit that this book uh, was written by uh, a couple of maesters from the Citadel, Maester Yandel, um, who was uh, the creation of Elio and Linda, <laughs> and uh, you know Maester Yandel's material uh, is is drawn from preceding sources, from primary sources that existed at the time court records and memoirs that people put down, letters, just as today's historians or historians of other ages worked from sources that came before them. One of the sources that uh, Maester Yenda works on is Archmaester Gildane, uh, who's, who has a far more detailed history of uh, Westeros, Frag only fragments of which have survived, the other portions have been lost. And uh, Gildane is essentially my guy, so uh, you know, the when I give a big chunk of Gilday and stuff, that's the, that's the unabridged stuff that I wrote. When it's Yandel, it's usually Elio and Linda cutting down on Gildane's <laughs> material that I wrote. So Gildane will get his day in the sun when we publish the uh, Grim Abrillion and then all of his uh, notes will finally be uncovered. Uh, and we also use other things. I mean, it, it, it was fun for us to, uh, to play with this whole idea of history and sources and historiography and so forth. Um, because the truth is, like in real history, uh, sometimes there are different counts of what actually happened. Um, I always love the, uh, the line from uh, The Man Who Shot Liberty Valance, you know, when, uh, when truth and legend disagree, print a legend. Um, and I think that's true, you know. You, you look at, I, I've often said in interviews, um, at the Red Wedding, my Red Wedding was based at least in part on the, on the Black Dinner of Scotland. Um, the, the Black Dinner of Scotland is, is, was one of the inspirations for Red Wedding, and it's a tremendously colorful event. But if, if you read about it, there's this great legend about how it happened. And then there's some boring accounts by modern historians who say, ah, oh, no, it didn't really happen like that. Those are all later things that people made up to make it more dramatic. And, you know, I hate those later historians. <laughs> I always want to rule, ruin everybody's fun. Uh, <laughs> but I wanted to reflect some of that in, in, in this. So even Gildane, who, who's not a primary source himself, is constantly going back to the actual primary sources, the court records kept by the maesters and, and some observations of the septons at the time. And in one case, one that I had particularly fun with, uh, the, the testimony of Mushroom who was the uh, court fool during the dance with the dragons, and he was a he was a dwarf with a large oversized head, and everybody thought he was feeble-minded. So you know they said all sorts of things in front of him because he's just an idiot, and what the hell is he going to understand? And of course he understood everything, and he wrote it down, and he not only that, his version is the absolutely most scurrilous yeah. version of because he's always putting the worst possible motives on everybody and and adding a lot of uh, sexual shenanigans and, uh, and uh, so forth that may or may not have happened. He's sort of the Suetonius of, uh, uh, of Westeros, if uh, those of you who know Roman history and uh, know Suetonius' work. <laughs> okay, so... Now here we have the... Uh, I believe it's the Battle of the Trident. It's Robert Baratheon. Uh, who is the king who, at the beginning of Game of Thrones, and he's fighting Prince Rhaegar Targaryen, um, who is uh, Daenerys's brother, and he's also the heir to the throne of the Mad King Aerys, um, who was shortly after this killed by Jaime Lannister. I got that right? That's right. <laughs> okay. Um, this is one of the key, uh, yeah. the key scenes in A Song of Ice and Fire that occurs, you know, before the book's open. <laughs> but it sets the stage and everything that, that, that follows. Uh, let's see, this is uh, Justin Sweet, right? The painting? Yes. Yes, Justin. Ma incredible artist, Justin Sweet. He's done some magnificent uh, work for us. Um, we've had a n several great artists do the Battle of the Trident scene. Um, 
What I like about Justin's version particularly is that he, he actually included the horse, the horses, um, because they, the two of them did fight on horseback, but most of the other artists who have uh, illustrated the scene for one reason or another have omitted the horses and have just shown the two men on foot. In that sense, they're quite a lot like the TV show, which omits the horses at many opportunities. Uh, <laughs> So where the, the TV show is, is short on horses. Yeah. Uh, but, uh, you know, but we have horses here, and that's, that's good. So the two of them were fighting in the middle of the trident, the ford of the trident, and uh, it was a whole turning point where the, everything that occurs in the books was, was set up by this uh, fight between two men. It's great to see them at this point looking you know, in the prime of their lives and so heroic because by the time we jump into the narrative of, of Game of Thrones, Robert is kind of over the hill. Uh, <laughs> it makes you, I mean, this makes you see why he was, you know, why people thought so highly of him to begin with. Um, yeah, Robert was like me when I began this. <laughs> <laughs> My hair was dark, I was skinnier, it was, you know, it was, I was different in 91. Hey. Um, you know, it's also, you know, Rhaegar has kidnapped Robert's betrothed and, and Ned's sister, but it's really the culmination of a lot of forces. I mean, this is a, a big personal confrontation, but it's also kind of a big, his, you know, kind of socio-political confrontation. Um, the the Tar Targaryens, King Ares was crazy and their, their sort of line seemed to be kind of decaying. Um, well, one of the, one of the factors uh, here is of course that uh, 300 years ago in Aegon's conquest, the Targaryens conquered the Seven Kingdoms with dragons. But then, during the later civil war called the Dance with the Dragons, the majority of those dragons were killed. And the few that survived that war died a relatively short time later or else left um, the known lands of Westeros. Um, so by that point, the Targaryens were firmly established as the kings and had, you know, the the power of uh, tradition and legitimacy behind them. Generations had come up of age with the idea of the Targaryens were the king and uh, that the rules didn't apply to them. I mean, that was also part of it. You know, Targaryens were interlopers from another culture and they had some um, unique factors that didn't necessarily fit into the, the mainstream of the other Westerosi lords, such as their traditional incest, uh, you know, which was part of keeping the bloodlines pure so that they could uh, better control the, the dragons, brother marrying sister and, and you know, um, nephews and aunts and, and so forth. And, and um, all of that is detailed in the book, all of the matches and, and so forth. But by the time this comes around, the Targaryens have not had dragons for a long time. And, and I guess Robert and some of the other lords are starting to say, you know, we don't <laughs> really have to be that afraid of these guys anymore. They can no longer, you know, just fly overhead and burn down our castles, our entire cities. And it's beginning to, this, this is beginning to dawn into it that maybe the Targaryens are just people like other people yeah. and not uh, an outside alien force with, uh, with strange, scaly superpowers. Of course, then Danny, well, you know. <laughs> so that's what the books are all about. The, the ability to tame or control the dragons to a certain extent is inherited. It's a sort of a, one of the more mysterious elements of the ongoing storyline. Well, it's something that's not quite entirely understood. And there is, I think, some interesting material in, in the world of Ice and Fire and even more so in the, in the later Grim early on that uh, will uh, elucidate various oh. attempts to, to tame uh, dragons. It's, it's not a, you know, it's not a simple process. Mm. Um, it's a dangerous process. You know, it, it's like, 
My friend Melinda Snodgrass, who, who uh, you met on one of your trips to uh, New Mexico, uh, raises and breeds and trains horses, um, Arabian horses and uh, dressage horses, warm bloods and, and so forth, and rides them in competition. And uh, when I was starting this long ago in the 90s, I, I talked to her about some of the you know, techniques for breaking a horse. You know, we, we all know the bronco buster kind of thing uh, that uh, you, we see in Western movies, but uh, of course that's just for one particular kind of horse. And what Melinda does with her Arabians and her dressage horses is quite different, but there is a process there, a process of mastery. And of course you also go stuff with the, the dog whisperer and you know, Jackson Galaxy and his cat from hell. There are ways to, <laughs> to try to make animals do what you want, but it's not an exact science. And, and the thing about horses and, and dogs and, and cats and trying to modify their behavior is that none of them can turn around and fry you to a crisp <laughs> as an annoyed dragon can, can do. So uh, it's a perilous process and I intended it to be so. Well, all right, let's, okay. So now we are looking at um, Damon, Demon Blackfire? Damon Blackfire. Damon Blackfire leading the charge at Redgrass Field by Jose Daniel Cabrera Peña. Um, so this is a this character from sort of deeper in the history of the Targaryen dynasty. And um, he is, I think, if I've got this right, looking at thing, he is Danny's great, 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 great grandfather. Is he? <laughs> <laughs> we, where's he? <laughs> Ask him, he would know just like that. I don't think so, actually. No? no? Because he's Damon Blackfire, right? That's what you said, Damon yeah. Blackfire at the Red Grass Field. Yeah. The Blackfires were, were a usurping line. Right. They, they were the sons of... Uh, no, he's, I'm sorry, he's not his guy. He's, the, he's, a, ba he's a bastard claimant to the throne yes. of, of Danny's great, 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 great grandfather. Sorry. <laughs> right. <laughs> Aegon... King, King Aegon IV, also known as Aegon the Unworthy, um, had a lot of bastards. He was a, he was a horny guy, and uh, <laughs> everywhere he went, he, uh, he followed children um, on serving wenches and tavern girls, but also on the daughters and wives of noblemen. Um, and he only had one, well, he had, he had a, um, he had one son by his legitimate wife, who was also his sister in the Targaryen thing, and that was his legitimate heir. But he didn't actually like that kid very much. And he liked some of his bastards better. And uh, he was, you know, he was not a popular king, Aegon the Unworthy. You could probably guess it from his name. Uh, <laughs> And he made a lot of trouble for Seven Kingdoms because on his deathbed, he legitimized all of his bastards. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, then that created the question of, okay, now they're legitimate, they're not bastards, where do they fall in the line of succession? And the, one of the oldest bastards who was a splendid, uh, you know, look like a Targaryen, um, great warrior, charismatic, handsome, um, he gave Blackfire which is that ancestral sword of uh, Aegon the Conqueror and all the Targaryen kings. And he presented the sword to, to his son, who was the warrior son. The, the, the son who was the crown prince was not much of a warrior. So in some sense, he was giving the sword to the son who was best fit to, to use it. Um, but that created the issue, well, does the sword represent the kingdom? Was he saying, this son should be my heir. He was unclear on that point. And uh, when you're unclear on that point in, in the Middle Ages, you normally got a war to <laughs> clarify the issue. And indeed, that's what happened here. Uh, Aegon and his supporters rose up, uh, or Damon and his supporters rose up after, after Aegon's death against uh, his uh, half-brother, uh, Darren. And uh, there was the first of the Blackfire rebellions. 
And it was followed by uh, four more Blackfire rebellions because uh, Damon Blackfire fathered children of his own and there was a whole another line of pretenders, the, the Blackfire pretenders that periodically would come invading Westeros and say, no, no, it, we're the legitimate kings and they would try to overthrow the Targaryens. Um, and this was all after the dragons had dined out. So in, in the days when there were dragons, the Targaryens might have been able to deal with this a little more easily. But uh, without dragons, it's all a question of who can raise the biggest armies and who can win the support of the, the, the powerful lords and the populace, and et cetera. Now, so the just questions of succession have, are yes. so, uh, are just, uh, well, not completely continuous throughout the story, but it comes up again and again. It, it's obviously very reminiscent of the, the real historical events that you've talked about being an inspiration, the Wars of the Roses, were similar, not so many bastards, but, um, but similar arguments about who is entitled to be the king. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, a, a large part of ancient history and medieval history is, is devoted to these succession uh, crises. Um, you know, the, the nation um, that could actually manage to get its, its laws and its succession in, in something approximating smoothness tended to flourish because they didn't have a war or regeneration when, when a king succeeded his father. But there were always issues that weren't really quite clear mm -hmm. or where they thought, well, this person has a claim, but this person also has a claim. So which claim do you, do you go with? And, and you see that in English history too. Um, All right, now here we have, I think this next one is the landscape. This is, I think has to be one of my favorite that's ones. That's Ted Naismith's wall. Yeah. yeah. It's, the, um, it's the wall and it, it very much reminds me of something that uh, you've said many times, which is that you, when you had been working in television before you started writing the books, you were so frustrated by how you couldn't get the sort of scale, the grandeur and scale that you wanted. And, and you knew that in fiction, you could just do whatever you want or make it as big as you want. And, and this, is re this is really big um, and really impressive. Um, can you talk a, a little bit about you know, what, what inspired this particular idea, the idea of the wall? Well, it was Hadrian's Wall, actually. In, in, in 1981, 10 years before I even dreamed of writing these books, I, I visited England for the first time, and my friend Lisa Tuttle, with whom I'd collaborated on Windhaven, was driving her, me around uh, England and Scotland and showing me the sights. And we came to Hadrian's Wall, or the bit that remains to it. And it was uh, around this time of year, actually. It was late October. It was fall, it was, it was getting dark and cold in, in uh, England and Scotland, and we arrived right near sunset as uh, the last of the tour buses were leaving. So uh, we climbed up on the wall and, and pretty much had it to ourselves, which um, was really cool because we didn't have a lot of tourists uh, around us. And I stood up there and the wind was blowing and the sun was going down and I looked off and, and, uh, and I tried to imagine what it was like to be a a Roman legionary from Italy or North Africa or the Near East who'd been sent to this really cold place uh, on the edge of the world and you know who knew what the hell was beyond there and you were like the last outpost of uh, what they thought of as the civilized world and um, you know they had legends and, and uh, beliefs um, and they may very well have thought there were, there were monsters or demons uh, beyond there, depending on where they came from. And of course, we know that what was actually beyond there were, were Scotsmen and, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and picks. There were picks back then. Um, uh, but it was a profound feeling. And, and many years later, when I came to uh, write these books, I, it, it came back to me, and I said, I, well, I want to do that too. Uh, the whole idea of, a, of a, a wall defending civilization against unknown threats beyond, and the people who have to stand on that wall and defend that wall, um, started something profound in me, that, uh, and, and I, wanted to, uh, I wanted to evoke that. Of course, in, in fantasy, 
fantasy, you, you take something real as your root, but you, you make it bigger and more colorful. So this is a, a lot bigger than Hadrian's Wall, and it's made of ice, which is kind of cool. And, uh, you know, actually needs some magic in it to keep it up and all that. But it's, uh, it's an amazing thing. And, of course, in the world of Westeros, it's one of, the, one of the eighth wonders of the world, or the seven wonders of the world, uh, of Lomas Long. No, actually, the, that's the nine wonders made by man, Lomas Longstrider. So, uh, and it would be if it existed in our world, too. In fact, you know, I was recently in Scotland for the uh, Edinburgh Book Festival, and they were having, uh, they were about to have their vote on independence, whether they should secede from uh, the United Kingdom or not. And I suggested that if they did, they should build a giant ice wall between, <laughs> between Scotland and England, and it would be, it would be an amazing tourist attraction, and uh, you know, really help the uh, the economy of both countries. We might have some trouble keeping it from melting, though. <laughs> um, okay, this is Winterfell. This is by, also by Ted. Uh, Naismith? Naismith? Yeah, Ted Naismith. Naismith. Um, and this is where the story begins for, you know, for your readers. Um, but now, you know, at the point that we are in the story now, it's been sort of destroyed and Ned is killed and there's something sort of really sad about looking at a picture of it now and it made me want to, made me wonder. Um, I know you're willing to tear down beautiful castles and kill <laughs> popular characters if when you feel like you need to, but do you ever end up missing them once they're gone? Yeah, I do miss them. Some of them. <laughs> <laughs> the bad ones as well as the good ones? Well, sometimes, yeah, a good villain is hard to replace. Yeah. But as I say in the book, all men must die. Yeah. Uh, I, there is something that appeals to me about... Uh, runes hmm. a a and uh, I don't know, beauty that's, that has been uh, destroyed or something like that. I was reflecting, I, you know, I, I own a movie theater in Santa Fe, New Mexico, where I live, much smaller one than this theater. And I walked in here and said, this is a pretty cool theater too. I like old theaters, 30s movie palaces and so forth. We had a, we had a guy uh, who, uh, New York photographer actually, his name is Matt Lambros. Uh, and he has a website called After the Final Curtain. He came to the Cocteau and uh, did a slideshow for us and an art exhibition of his photographs. He specializes in traveling around the country photographing um, defunct theaters, uh, some of them movie palaces and others, um, vaudeville theaters and things like that that have been closed, be it for five years or 50 years, and they're still there. They're, they're rotting, they're decaying. Uh, some of them are far gone, some of them are almost look like they were just closed yesterday, but there's, there's a strange beauty to all of those. So there is something beautiful about uh, runes. I mean, when I, when I tour, you, when I go to Europe, you know, we don't have many castles here in America, but when I go to Europe, I, I like to visit castles, but I, I, my preference is always the, the ruined castles, the way I can clamor over the runes and try to imagine the way it was, or, or at least the castles that were fortresses rather than the ones that may be called a castle, but they're really like a, uh, a palace from, from a house, the Jacobean yeah. age, and, yeah. and they're full of antique furniture. And uh, now that they're, uh, they're a four-star hotel, you know, those, are, <laughs> those have their appeals, but uh, give me an, a good rune any day. <laughs> um, okay, and here we have the, the, um, the Irie. Irie. Uh, and a site of the infamous moon door, giving many people nightmares. Yeah, I um, worked very closely with Ted on all of these. Yeah. This was the first art that was done for this book. I, I, wanted, uh, I wanted accurate versions of these castles. We've had a number of different artists draw them on covers and you know, on the fantasy flight cards and games, and some of them have been beautiful images, but not necessarily accurate to what I described. Mm -hmm. But I knew with Ted Naismith, we were getting one of the great landscape painters of, of, the, uh, of the world, really, and a, uh, a guy who does really great architectural work. So he and I worked very closely on these and going back and forth on them until we got them pretty much as I see them in my, in my mind's eye. 
This one looks like the King Ludwig uh, castle in Bavaria. Uh, definitely, yeah, definitely inspired by that. But Ludwig didn't think of the sky cells, which yeah. is uh, yeah. uh, <laughs> that was that was my own perverse <laughs> invention. <Yeah. laughs> um, this, uh, looking at this made me uh, want to ask you if there's one place in all of your books that you would like to live in, which one would that be? One place that I would like to live in. A city uh, or a castle or a... Well, I mean, there are aspects about a number of them that, that attract me. Um, you know, I do like cold weather, so I actually probably would like Winterfell. You know, the, the cold winds never gets too hot there. That's good. Uh, I would like that. Casterly Rock has the advantage of having a lots of gold. <laughs> 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 so you'd, you'd be very, very rich living there. The, the Irie has magnificent views. Uh, you know, down in Dorne, you, you get great spicy food and great spicy women. Uh, so that's good, uh, you know. But ultimately, I think I'd like to stay in Santa Fe, New Mexico, because uh, <laughs> we have like modern medicine and uh, and the NFL on Sunday. Although after the after the way the Jets played today, I may give that up. <laughs> <laughs> A very practical answer. Okay. Um, all right, um, this is the Red Keep at King's Landing. Um, so y you already answered one of my questions, which was, you know, how well these match your own vision of the place. I know you don't want to talk about the TV show too much, but um, which of the locations do you feel the most true to what you imagined? Uh, in the TV show? Yeah. Um. Well, there are locations. I mean, we're, we're shooting, you know, in Belfast. Mm -hmm. We're shooting in, uh, we've shot some in Scotland. But Belfast in Northern Ireland is our ma main location. We've also shot in Iceland. We're shooting in Spain right now. We've done a lot in Croatia. We've used Morocco and Malta um, in past years. So there's many, many different uh, actual existing locations that, uh, that have been used over, over the years. Um, None of them are exactly what I described in my book, uh, but they sure are gorgeous. I mean, I, I think we're the, probably the best looking show on television. Yeah. Um, and some of the interior sets are pretty amazing too. Do you get frustrated ever when it's not quite what you imagined? I would say, I wouldn't say frustrated. I mean, sometimes it's it's better, you know. I th I think like their uh, their version of the high hall of the Arons uh, with the moon door in the floor is probably better than my moon door, which is just a door set in the wall. Because uh, I didn't think of putting it in the floor. <laughs> uh, that was pretty cool. I like, you know, the the show's Iron Throne has become uh, iconic. It's now recognized around the world. It's, it's numerous people have done parodies. You know, Mad Magazine has had a version made of toilet plungers. And uh, <laughs> they, they've shown, you know, sports commissioners have sat on ones made of baseball bats. And uh, their, their actual physical versions of the throne is like six of them in the United States and three or four of them in Britain. And Spain has one. And, you know, these travel around for publicity. So I recognize it's a, it's a great looking throne and it has become iconic, but it's not really my Iron Throne. Uh, in this book, you'll see my Iron we Throne. We have one of the slides we have coming up, not the next one, but the one right after that. So um, look at the next one, which is of uh, Dragonstone. Um, this is- Yeah, Dragonstone has been a bitch. Uh, <laughs> Because it's, it's, it's really a unique castle. I mean, it's, I, you know, some of this is very easy for me as a, as a writer to describe. Yeah. Uh, but it's, it's not necessarily easy for the artist to draw. This was probably, I think, the most over-the-top illustration in the, in the book. But probably the most accurate to, to really? what's actually described in the, in the book in all the versions of Dragonstone. I mean, 
Dragonstone is, is made by the Valerians, who, who had dragons and dragon fire and, and magical means of making stone flow and twist, and they could make it into any form that they wanted to, and then it would harden in that form. So they, they built these massive structures of, of not of bricks or of stones mortared together, but of solid stone shaped by intense fires and, and, and magic. And in the case of Dragonstone, like the towers look like great stone dragons. And, you know, the entrances look like the heads of dragons. And, you know, I allude to this in the book, but it's difficult for a, um, an artist to capture. Um, so a lot of the versions that we've had of Dragonstone over the years have been not not really great, and this is one of the best here. This is by Philip Straub, by the way. Um, and is the Iron Throne the next one? Yes. <laughs> I'll get back to that This yet. is the correct version of the Iron Throne. Yeah, the, I mean, I state repeatedly in the book that the Iron Stone is huge. Huge. Um, they did it towers over the room like a great beast, and it's ugly, it's asymmetric. It, 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 uh, it's, it was put together by blacksmiths, not by craftsmen and experts in furniture manufacture. Uh, and you have to walk up iron steps, and when a king sits on it, he's like 10 feet above everybody else in the hall, so he's in this raised position looking down on him. And the hall itself is, is huge. Um, and the throne is made of the swords of the defeated enemies. Uh, yeah, the throne, the throne is made of uh, the, all the swords, you know, when during Aegon's conquest, when people surrendered to them, they, they set down their sword as a series of submission. And of course, when he won a battle by burning everybody, there were all these burned, melted swords lying around. So he gathered all of them up and he gave them and said, make a throne out of this. And that's what they did. And it's a, it's a sign of dominance and conquest. Um, and when you stand before it, you're supposed to remember that, you know, look on my work, she mighty and despair, uh, was a little bit of the, uh, of the psychology of that, but nobody ever got it right. I mean, there were comic book versions and there were versions in a card game and the, and the board game and there were versions on the cover and there were versions that were done for conventions, you know, the very first, there was a wooden one that I sat on in 1996 at the, at the ABA uh, that looked like the embossed version on the first edition of the Silver Book, but none of them were ever really right. Um, the closest one who ever came was, was Mark Simonetti, the French artist, and even his first one wasn't right, but it, since he was the closest, I worked with him, and then we got him for his book, and he and I went back a half dozen times to finally get something I could say, yeah, this is, this is absolutely right. Now, of course, you can't do this in a TV show. It's not something I criticize HBO for or something like that. I mean, the, the thrones they have are enormously large and, and cumbersome to move and expensive to build. To build this monstrosity would, would blow the budget of an entire episode, and it wouldn't fit in the set. I mean, our throne room, our throne room is, is uh, in the paint hall in, Bel in Belfast in Northern Ireland. Now, the paint hall is the largest soundstage in Europe. It was it originally part of the old Harlan and Wolf shipyard where they built the Titanic and they painted the, the ships, uh, the hulls of the ships in, in this hole, which gives you the idea of the scale of it. And we've divided it into a number of pods and our throne room is in one of them. And it's a very large set, but it's not large enough. You would need St. Paul's Cathedral. If, if they would give us St. Paul's Cathedral <laughs> or <laughs> Westminster Abbey to shoot in, and a year to build a giant throne like that of, of, that would dominate the entire thing and go halfway to the ceiling, then you could get the Iron Throne the way it's described in the books. But this is the difference between books and television. You know, I can, I can say, well, that the wall is 700 feet high, but I don't actually have to build a seven foot, 100 foot high wall or a giant throne made of, made of nasty looking swords here. Um, it's interesting. <coughs> There's actually a, a terrific speech that Littlefinger gives in, uh, in, in last season uh, where he talks about uh, <coughs> the Iron Throne made from a thousand thrones of, of Aegon's enemies. And then he said, I counted them once and really there's only 137. And uh, <laughs> you know, it's the when truth, is, when truth and legend disagree, print the legend. 
And it's an interesting speech that's true in the show, <laughs> but it's not true in the books because it, there really are thousands of swords uh, in the real Iron Throne, the, the gigantic Iron Throne that sits, uh, that sits in King's Landing in the books. It reminds me a little bit of uh, Tamerlane was supposedly made a huge pile of his defeated enemy skulls as a monument to his greatness, and that's what this has always reminded me of. It's great to see it. You know, it was a tradition among many conquerors, the, the pyramid of skulls. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> it, it's, you know, one of those things you can always go back to. The old <laughs> traditions are, are good. <laughs> this is probably more structurally stable. Okay. Um, all right, now this is um, a, a trial by combat, if I am correct, between Sir Duncan the Tall of the Kingsguard and uh, Lord Lionel Baratheon. And this is um, the, the character in white, is, Sir Duncan, is the dunk, is, is the character. Is the dunk of Duncan Egg, Duncan yes. Egg. But I haven't really told this story yeah. yet, so. So, so uh, you know, we'll, we'll get to it eventually <laughs> in like yeah. the seventh or eighth Duncan Egg story. Yeah. So yeah. Well, he, he joins the King's Guard. Newsflash. Um, well, we kind of knew. We kind of knew that. Yeah, that's okay. that's All right, well, that's okay. reference in the books. He's fighting Lionel Baratheon. Right. That's the newsflash. Right. In his capacity as the leader of the King's Guard, is he? Well, not initially, but eventually. Is there anything more you want to tell us about that? No. Okay. <laughs> Actually, this was one of, one of the hardest things about putting this book together yeah. was, was the question of uh, how much to tell and how much not to tell. Um, because the readers, of course, want to know everything. And I, I knew some things, and you know, I, I shared some of them with my, my editor, Ann Grohl, and someone with Elio and Linda. Um, but there are things that I wanted to reveal in later books, in later novels, or in, like in the case of that, in later Duncan Egg stories. So it was, it was like, you know, I suggested um, at one point, like when we were dealing with, with uh, one of the big mysteries of the, that people want to know a lot about was uh, Summerhall. And um, I don't. Summer Hall. Uh, should we explain what Summer Hall is? Does everyone know what it is? It's Summer, yeah. Summer Hall was a all do. Targaryen secondary castle um, that was uh, in the uh, sort of the border where the Stormlands and the Reach and the Dornish Marches all come together, and it was uh, home castle to uh, Egg's father in the Duncan Egg stories and to some other Targaryen princes during a certain period of time. But it was destroyed at a, at a certain point, and there have been references to the book. Something happened at Summer Hall, something, something dark and traumatic. And what exactly happened? And the readers all want to know this. And I know what happened, but I don't want to tell the readers yet, <laughs> because I want to reveal that in a later Dunk and Egg story. But how do we get around that? Because the Maester is writing the history, and this is a very important event. So I suggested that since we're doing this as a mock facsimile, that perhaps Maester Yandel could write a detailed account and then accidentally knock over his ink well, and there would be a big <laughs> blotch on that page uh, <laughs> when, you, when you got to that book. That was my answer here. Uh, Anne actually talked me out of that because she felt that... Uh, that if we did that, a lot of customers would be returning to the bookstore and say, oh, I got a defective copy. There's a big blotch here on page 314. Could you give me a copy that has that in? Uh, you're not going to actually find out much about Summerhall in this book. Sorry to tell you. We didn't do the blotch, but we got around it in another uh, ma matter. But uh, that was, unfortunately, my reaction to a lot of this stuff at point. I, well, wait a minute. I don't want to reveal that. I'm going to use that in a later dunk. No, no, no. You can't tell them that. I, that's a good detail. No, no, no. Leave that out. And <laughs> finally, Elio and Linda and Anne ganged up on it. I said, you have to tell them some of these things. <laughs> so I did. And actually, I made up, uh, you know, there, there, there's amazing amount of new material in this book and, and stories that I made up just for the book and stories that I eventually was going to include in the novel, and they'll still be in the novels and the Duncan Egg stories, but if you read this, you'll already know somewhat of 
what has happened. So there's, there's lots of new stuff in here, but uh, um, I still have mixed feelings about telling things like that duel with Sir Barathon and, okay. and the Laughing we, Storm, but I'll get to it eventually. We've got a couple of more images, but I need to get to the questions, so let's just go through them quickly. This is the, um, the Ironborn Longship at Sea by uh, Tomaj, do you know, uh, Jedruzek? I, I, Tomaj Jedruzek, yes, he's, yeah. he's, he's Eastern European. This is an incredible. <laughs> uh, uh, I had a lot of fun with the histories of the Ironborn, though they're a bunch of colorful bastards. Yeah, they're, <laughs> they've got a mis very mysterious past that I found one of the more intriguing parts of this. And then here's Aegon again, that handsome devil. Um, and I think we'll go back to, this is by uh, Magalia Villanueve. And we'll go back to the cover and get to some of these questions. Magali is, uh, by the way, doing the uh, next year's Ice and Fire calendar. So she's uh, pretty amazing. Uh, she's a French artist. Um, she does amazing portraits in particular. Um, go back to her, her egg on again. Yeah. Mm, it doesn't go backwards. All right. Well, we don't want to run through it all. We've been time. very proud of the, uh, the, the calendars that we've done. We had uh, uh, Michael oh, no. Comark. Ted Naismith, um, John Picaccio, um, let me see, uh, Gary Gianni, uh, and this year Donato Giancola had all done the uh, past calendars. I love fantasy art. I love illustrated books. And a uh, chance to do these calendars, these art calendars, is, is uh, you know, one that I, that I really appreciate. Uh, we're trying to make it a, a rival to the long-running Tolkien calendar and get gets just some of the amazing best fantasy artists in the world to do it. So Mangali is the first uh, woman to do it, so we wanted to, uh, you know, vary that a bit and uh, have her bring a, a different perspective. Uh, second French person, but uh, the first woman. Um, so she's gonna do some spectacular work, so take, keep an eye out for that next, uh, next year. But meanwhile, the, the 2015 calendar by uh, Donato is, uh, is out and on sale, and that one is amazingly gorgeous, too. Okay, well, these, these are some fantastic questions, both from this crowd and from Tumblr. So I, I'm going to go for some of the more manageable, manageable ones. First, from Jeff22003 via Tumblr. Who are your influences for Stanis Baratheon? <clears throat> is he based on anyone from history, literature, or politics? Um, to some extent, he is, he is uh, inspired by Tiberius Caesar. Um, not necessarily, partly to Tiberius Caesar from history, but to a great extent by Tiberius Caesar as portrayed um, by, um, God, I'm blanking on the actor's name, Baker, I believe, uh, in I, Claudius, incredible British TV series, I, Claudius, George Baker, I believe it was, yes, uh, played Tiberius in that, and uh, there are significant differences too, but um, that series, if you haven't seen I, Claudius, it's, it's uh, one of the great historical television series of all time. Uh, incredible acting by Sean Phillips as Livia and, of course, Derek Jacobi as, uh, as Claudius himself, and uh, John Hurt is in it as Caligula, Brian Blessed as Augustus. All of them got an enormous amount of acclaim for, for their uh, portrayals and deservedly show. Um, the writing was also amazing, based on the, the Robert Graves book, but, uh, you know, the scripting was, was terrific. Uh, George Baker, though, was a very important character in the first six or so episodes, and uh, he doesn't seem to get the acclaim that the other people got, and I think he really should. His Tiberius was, was terrific. So that was at least one inspiration, but uh, they're not at all the same character, but they do share certain, certain characteristics. Um, in terms of world building, how do you separate culture and ethnicity from religion in your writing, and how do you reconcile them? That's a big one. There's a couple of questions about the religion of uh, Westeros in this stack, so it may be that you'll... you'll... 
Well, you know, that's the kind of abstract question I find it difficult to answer. I mean, I, I don't know how other people write, but I don't, I don't ever sit down and say, mm, how am I going to separate ethnicity from religion here in this, <laughs> in this thing? It's like I'm more, okay, we just went over a mountain range. Who lives here? What should their religion be? What, what, <laughs> who can I steal from in history to model them on uh, that I haven't already used, uh, you know? And, uh, and that sort of thing. So it, it's, it's a different process entirely. Uh, but I, I do always try to consider the question of religion, which I, I think is important because religion shapes societies and shapes cultures and shapes values and even in our our modern world of course we see conflicts all around the world being driven by religious disputes even even now um and of course through history god the religious disputes are legion and the millions of people who have died in the names of of that are it's appalling to uh, to think about. Um, I was raised Catholic, um, but have long since stopped practicing. I suppose I'd be considered a skeptic now, and it, I, I just look at religions. Um, they really uh, are you really going to kill all these people because a, a giant invisible guy in the sky told you to? Uh, and, and your giant invisible guy in the sky is different. But, but you can't ignore religion uh, in, in fantasy, I think, because it's, it's too important in history. And the other thing that, of course, is, is worth mentioning about religion is uh, in fantasy is that in most fantasies, you have working magic. You have magic that demonstrably works, <laughs> which would affect the religious feelings of many people, you know? Even when I was a Catholic and, and going to catechism and, and I was being taught all these Catholic things, you know, I would sort of say, uh, uh, sister, uh, what? Why is it that all this walking on water and raising the dead and stuff took place like 2,000 years ago? Because if it took place now, I would be much more convinced <laughs> if I could see it on television, you know? And, and indeed, if, if I would become the most religious guy in the world if, if uh, we could actually see someone raising the dead or, you know, ascending to heaven or, or uh, you know, doing any of these things we read about in the Bible and, and other... Um, ancient uh, religious text. Um, and in fantasy, that, that does happen here. We're, we are seeing uh, in, in the red god, you know, for example, in my own books, people say, well, why are the Brotherhood Without Banners abandoning their own religion that they were raised with, the seven, to follow Thoros of Myrrh and the red god? Well, it's partly because they've seen him raise the dead. Not, not once, but several times. Yeah. That's persuasive. Yeah. <laughs> so they're thinking, well, maybe this guy has the right of it here. Yeah. Um, because uh, Westeros is sort of based on a medieval European world, it's actually kind of striking how uh, one of the differences is that the medieval European world was so much more saturated with religion than, than I think Westeros is. Well, religion's pretty, pretty much there in Westeros. It's, you know... Um, I guess they don't exactly have a pope. Well, but the, the faith of the seven does have a pope. It's the High Septon. Um, but, uh, of course, we're seeing in the course of the books what, what's happened when you know, the High Septons who are in when the story begins are the kind of corrupt mm. High Septons who like to sit around their palaces and eat chocolates and <laughs> little little boys, you know. And, but in the, 
in the process of that, they have been replaced by the character that I call the High Sparrow, who is a reforming zealot um, who has a very different and more fundamentalist attitude towards some of these beliefs. And some people, like Cersei, are discovering, uh, you know, to her dismay, that he can't be treated the same way as the previous yeah. corrupt ones. So, so I'm certainly trying to deal with religion. And there's also a lot of uh, material in the world of ice and fire, and will be even more in the Grimmerillion about what happened to the, uh, the faith when the Targaryens took over and, and uh, the conflicts between them and the war between uh, Aegon's sons and the faith militant and all of that stuff, which leads up to why, why things are the way they are in the present day. Yeah. I really liked that part in particular of the book. Um, okay, this is kind of long, but um, okay, you wrote the foreword to Maurice Drouin's A Cursed King series and consider yourself a fan. Do you feel you drew any inspiration from Robert of Artois for the character of Gregor Clagant? I'm sorry, I'm sorry, The Mountain That Rides. Um, Again, I, I'm sorry. I just, I, yeah, no, I, that's I fine. The Accursed King series was certainly an influence on Game of Thrones. It's a, it's a, if you haven't read it, it's a terrific series of historical novels uh, written by a French writer named Maurice Drawn. And it, it's uh, not fantasy, it's strictly historical. It relates the, uh, you know, basically the fall of the Capetian dynasty and uh, the beginnings of the Hundred Years' War. Um, but it's got some stuff in it that's almost fantasy-like, you know, the, the Curse of the Templars and uh, the, um, the downfall of, uh, of, of Philip the Fair and all three of his sons. And uh, it's got poisonings and impersonations and battles and, uh, you know, adulterous affairs and uh, all kinds of great stuff, all straight from history, um, which is cool. And part of uh, one of the secondary subplots does revolve around this, this fight between two lords, cousins actually, for this particular province, and Robert Artois is one of them. And he is a big, blustering guy. I wouldn't say he was an influence on the mountain that rides, though, uh, aside from being big. Um, as I recall, he's described as quite large, but uh, he's more like Robert Baratheon in, in, in some sense. He's a big, blustering, kind of hard-drinking, hard-living, sort of man, the mountain is a kind of quietly homicidal, homicidal sociopath. Yeah. Um, so they're very different. Okay. Um, when do you create the maps? Before, during, or after you write the story? The, the map creation is ongoing. Um, you know, when I, when I began back in 1991, I'd probably written like 50 pages, and I said, oh, I better create a map so I know where I am. <laughs> Maps are, are necessary to fantasy, I think. Uh, I know some critics uh, occasionally have uh, sort of made, mocked them, but if, if you're creating a secondary world, uh, really need them because, you know, yeah, if I'm writing straight historical fiction and my character in Ireland says, I must go to France, you don't need a map. We kind of know where France is. But in my world, if a character from Winterfell says, I must go to Dorne, you don't know if Dorne is the next village or, you know, or halfway around the world. So you better have a map so these things that the characters are saying make, make some sense. Um, so I created a map, and it was, you know, basically pretty simple. But as the story continued, I started adding more and more, more and more places yeah. to it, and it's ongoing. And then, of course, a couple of years ago, we did the map book, Lands of Ice and Fire, um, which involved considerably more map creation um, because they wanted maps of places, you know, like. Initially, it was said, like, okay, George, we, we want to do this map book here. Can we, uh, we'll just take the maps that are in the books and we'll blow them up and they'll be beautiful poster size. Oh, that, that's great. That won't take any work from me at all. <laughs> and then when you blow them up to poster sizes, though, you get the call, hey, yeah, when we, 
We take these maps from the front of the book and we blow them up to post their size. It's a lot of blank space. <laughs> <laughs> Could you kind of like invent some rivers and hills and towns and stuff to put there? So I wound up detailing that. And that was especially cute when you got over to Essos because like, you know, my map of the Dothraki Sea, when the time we did the map book, it was, there was a sheet of white paper and there was a dot in it and <laughs> buys Dothrak and a little mountain drawn next to it, mother of mountains, and then Dothrak I see written over the entire blank <laughs> page. So yeah, I think I need to, you know, put a lot more in this one too. So there's a lot of ma ma yeah. making there. <laughs> I would guess the answers to that are during and after. That's right. Um, and more tomorrow, I'm sure. Okay. Um, sort of metaphysical. Is there any connection between the Lord of Light and the White Walkers in terms of God and the devil? No. <laughs> <laughs> the birth of a dragon seems to be connected to fire and death. Does birthing a dragon require a human sacrifice? <laughs> interesting notion. I mean, there are clues in the, <laughs> in the books. Uh, so, you know, I, I think I'm going to dodge that one right now. <laughs> Our, the Lord of Light, by the way, Melisandre's religion, which was referenced in the previous thing. Uh, again, I, I, I don't try to do direct things from history, but I'm certainly inspired by a lot of real history. And the, the, uh, the religion of the Lord of Light is, is based in part on, on a couple of the dualist religions that actually existed in our world. One of them, the Zoroastrian, I can never say that. Zoroastrian. Yeah, whatever that is, yes. And the other one, the, the Cathars, or the Albigensians, who were uh, destroyed. Um, they were a Christian heresy uh, that flourished in southern France, and um, a crusade was launched against them. Um, and they were ultimately all wiped out in what is sometimes called Europe's first genocide. Um, the famous, uh, famous statement, uh, kill them all, God will, God will sort them out, uh, actually dates back to the Albigensian uh, crusade when they captured, when the crusaders, the Christian crusaders captured an Albigensian city, but only half of the people in it were Albigensians, the rest were good Catholics. And the, one of the people said, well, how do we, they, they look just like us. How do we know who to kill? And uh, the commander said, kill them all, God will know his own. Um, and that's, that's straight out of uh, real history. But uh, the Cathars were a very strange heresy that make fascinating reading because they were, they were true dualists. I mean, Christianity has this... Uh, concept of God and the devil, but the devil is definitely, you know, second place. He's, he's not the equal to God. He's, he's a, a loser. Mm -hmm. And uh, God permits him to do a little things, but in the end, there's no <laughs> doubt who's going who's gonna to come out. Um, the Albigensians, it was a real dualist system uh, where they thought there, there's a dark God and there's a a, light, a god of light, there's a god of good and a god of evil, and they're per, at perpetual war, and um, they're, they're equal, and we don't know who's going to win. Um, but the, the interesting part of it, you know, they, I mean, they were a Christian heresy, and their belief was that Jesus was actually uh, the son of the, the god of light, uh, and so therefore he didn't really have a real body that you know, here, here they were kind of straying from Orthodox Catholic teaching um, because the body that we all live in is a creation of the God of evil. And indeed, the world that we live in is a creation of the God of evil. And it was a fairly persuasive argument, especially in the early Middle Ages, because they looked around and they said, look at this world that you live in where people, you know, there's no justice, there's no peace, people come by and kill you and rape your women and burn your crops and the lords can cut off your head at any times and you're going to get all these horrible d 
diseases and you're going to sicken and die and, and going to be, you know, in great pain and women bring forth children in pain. What kind of good God would design this world? Obviously, this world has been created by the evil God and the good God is, is trying to get us out of it. Um, and that was, you know, the Catholics refuted this argument by killing them all. Uh, <laughs> Uh, so that makes fascinating reading, but that's, that's the seed from which the Melisandre's Lord of Light comes, that and, and Zoroaster, which was similar, but, but I can't pronounce, so I won't talk. <laughs> what is your editing process? Do you always work with the same editor? I know that you do. It's Anne Rule, right? Yeah, Anne Grohl, uh, who, who I believe is here, is, has been my editor on this. Uh, Almost since the beginning, um, she, it was actually purchased by Bantam by uh, another editor who, uh, and Anne was at a different house that tried to purchase it but lost. Mm -hmm. But then the other editor left and Anne came over to the house and wound up being my editor at uh, the place and she's been uh, with me since the beginning. And then over in the UK, I have uh, Jane Johnson of HarperCollins has been my editor since the beginning and, and they've both been great. It's been terrific to, uh, to work with them. This person wants to know how much input does she have? I, I don't know, how to, 17%. I, <laughs> 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 I send her stuff and uh, you know, she makes comments and uh, she gives me notes um, and I revise some things and I don't revise some things and uh, sometimes we have uh, discussions or arguments about it. Um, and yeah, it's, and I get separate notes from Jane too from uh, England. So they're, they're the two editors who weigh in when I deliver a manuscript. My, and also Elio and Linda, I usually send them a copy too, but they catch different things. But oh, this guy's, this guy's <laughs> eyes were a different color in book three. Uh, <laughs> or you have a horse here that's changed sex. So that one got through. They didn't catch that one, but uh, <laughs> I have a transsexual They're horse. They're only human. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, this is, a, this is the one I didn't anticipate. Do your books have any references to the Grateful Dead? You call your home Terrapin Station, and the song Dire Wolf and Cassidy and Dark Star have names and references in the books. <laughs> There's a portion of the audience that really cares about this question. <laughs> well, I'm certainly a fan of the Grateful Dead. I've attended uh, Grateful Dead um, concerts, and uh, my wife Paris is perhaps even more of a fan of the Grateful Dead. And uh, there are a lot of Grateful Dead references in my, uh, my famous rock and roll uh, novel, The Armageddon Rag. In fact, at one point we were hoping to uh, make a movie of that and, and film the, the con Nazgul concert scenes at Grateful Dead concerts. Um, but of course that came to nothing, sad to say. Um, and I do have Grateful Dead lyrics always coming around and rattling around in my head. Ripple is one of my favorite songs of all time. There is a road, no simple highway. <laughs> but actually in this book, I don't know. Or any know. of the Ice and Fire books? It sounds like these are... Uh, maybe. I, I, I'd have to th think about that. Not intentionally. Not that I can remember. <laughs> How did you decide on the name Hodor? <laughs> um... That's not his real name. That's just what they call him. Yeah. <laughs> his real name is Walder. If you were named Walder, you might want to be called Hodor, too. Uh, I don't know. You have to keep reading. Okay. Ooh, that question is... Uh, uh, this book, this particular book, reminds this question asker of some illustrated Bibles I read as a kid. Were they an inspiration for the design of the World of Ice and Fire? Uh, no. <laughs> I, I, we had an illustrated Bible, as I recall. Um, so I've seen illustrated Bibles. But I actually grew up with illustrated books. I love illustrated books. 
I had, uh, you know, as a kid, I had Treasure Island and uh, King Arthur and his Knights, you know, with those uh, amazing N.C. Wyeth illustrations, which I, I fell in love with. And, um, and kids' books, you know, some of the things I had always had some artwork in them, too. And, of course, I love comic books. I think it's a shame that most contemporary books are not illustrated, um, that we've fallen out of that. And, you know, since I've become um, popular enough to kind of get my druthers on some of these, I've, I've taken steps to have many of my books illustrated in limited editions. A number of these books are, uh, have been done by Subterranean Press in beautifully illustrated editions with tons of black and white interiors and gorgeous covers and, and uh, so forth. Um, and we have the Dunkin' Egg stories, actually. We, the, after this book, my next book will be next spring, and it will be called The Night of the Seven Kingdoms. And it is a collection of the three published Dunkin' Egg novellas, The Hedge Knight, The Sworn Sword, and The Mystery Knight, but illustrated by Gary Gianni. And uh, Gary did uh, the Ice and Fire calendar a couple years ago. He's, he's done Prince Valiant for years. He, he did the Wandering Star uh, books for uh, Bran McMorn and Solomon Kane. Gorgeous books if you don't have those and you're a Robert E. Howard fan. Some of the most beautiful books I've ever seen. And, uh, you know, Johnny looks like N.C. Wyeth returned from the dead in some of his work. He's just an amazing artist. So we wanted him to illustrate the Dunkin' Egg. Uh, collection and you know our thought was well do a couple color pieces and then like seven or eight interior illustrations that you can do and he read them and and fell in love with them and got back and said well I'll do it but I don't want to do that what I want to do is like a picture for every page wow. and uh, just have this thing absolutely loaded with gorgeous uh, art and so that's what he's been working on for the last year and a half or so. So when that comes out, that's going to be an amazing illustrated book, The Night of the Seven Kingdoms. Be sure to get the hardcover of that one. It'll be worth, well worth it. What would the sigil and words of House Martin be? <laughs> <laughs> oh, boy, I, I don't know. I once designed a shield for myself when I, in, in the early ages of... Uh, working on a series, what the hell did I put on it? I think I put references to my, some of my previous books on it. Um, what would the words be? Maybe deadline, what <laughs> deadline? <laughs> Is there anything you wrote in the earlier books that you feel back to into a narrative corner? Uh, there's certainly, and th that's overstating it. I mean, there's certainly mistakes in the earlier books that, uh, you know, there's that transsexual horse I mentioned and <laughs> There are some eyes to change color. Um, these, are, these are simple mistakes, um, but they irritate me because uh, I don't want to make any mistakes. And also because there are in the books deliberate inconsistencies where I'm using the device of the unreliable narrator or, or using a point of view structure that I do where two people remember something that happened in very different ways. and, and may not be remembering it accurately. And because there are these other mistakes, some of my readers tend to assume that those things are also mistakes um, when they're not. Um, you know, they're me being very clever. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's irritating. Um, there's, there's the... Um, there are, again, it, these are all relatively minor things. I wouldn't say they back me into a corner. Where the, the introduction of Tyrion, where he does like a, a, a stumble salt over, off a door frame and, and lands on his feet the first time he meets Jon Snow, was probably something I could have left out. Um, I've kind of explained it later and uh, done a pretty good job of it, I think, but uh, it, it, it still 
might have been better just uh, omitted. <laughs> um, also, in that same uh, that same chapter where uh, they're having a feast at Winterfell and the king's party is there and and all that, it's from John's viewpoint, I believe, is the viewpoint character in that scene. And Bran is not mentioned when everybody goes marching forth and so forth. And numerous fans have written me letters about you know the deep meaning of why <laughs> Bran is omitted, and it, it's just I sort of forgot about Bran when I was <laughs> writing that chapter. I just, he was there, I just happened to, didn't, John wasn't glancing in his direction and didn't mention him that thing. So that's the kind of stuff that, you know, gets by you, but it, I, I don't think it's backing you into the corner. It's, oh, yeah, I made a little misstep there. I stubbed my toe. Okay, well, we need to wind down now, but I just want to, I have a question that I'm, I was asked to ask you by a friend. Um, there's a rumor that when you met with David Benioff and Dan Weiss to talk, who are the showrunners of the HPS show, to talk about adapting the books, there was one question that you asked them. Yes, that's true. That's, yeah. that's not a rumor, that's true. Okay. I asked them an, a, an important question because I wanted to determine how carefully they had, uh, they had read the books. And that question is, who is Jon Snow's mother? That was the question, yes. So you and I, I will that. say no more about it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. But uh, yeah, you know, we had a great meeting at the at the Palm Restaurant in Los Angeles. We met for hours and discussed the books for hours, and uh, you know, it was it was great. But in Hollywood, um, and this is the first time I'd met either David and Dan. I was I was. Uh, you know, when I, the meeting was set up, I looked him up, and of course I was already familiar with some of David's works, not, not quite so much with Dan, but I knew their credits, and uh, it was, certainly seemed to be a great meeting, but, you know, in Hollywood, there's a lot of bullshit artists out there, so, uh, you know, you have, to, you have to be careful. So I, I wanted to, you know, they, they said they'd read the books and they loved them, and I thought I'd see how carefully <laughs> they had read the books and they passed with flying colors, yeah, so yeah, it was great. Mention. All right, well, um, thank you uh, to George. <laughs> thank you for coming. Thank you all. <laughs> <laughs>